C'est bien vous qui êtes vous Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to La Maison de la Paix. That way, some words will have been said in French. Um, welcome to La Maison de la Paix and to this uh, event, the launching of the new commentary on the Geneva Conventions. Welcome also to uh, the Acer Institute in The Hague, which is organizing a webcast event uh, on this uh, launching. Welcome as well as, uh, to all of you who are watching this event online. You may contribute to the discussion via Twitter, sending us your questions with a hashtag. We are very modern. Uh, Geneva Conventions Commentary Without Spaces. I repeat, Geneva Conventions Commentary Without Spaces. We will deal with the questions either in this session or in the next session, because this afternoon will be a quite long and busy afternoon, especially for the editors. Since after this official launching, there will be a discussion with the uh, students, both of the Geneva Academy and of uh, the Geneva Law Faculty, with the editors in room B, just just uh, on the other side, uh, which is open to the public, naturally, you are welcome to attend this uh, second session, which will begin at 2.30 after a first, uh, second ANCA, which uh, is offered by the Graduate Institute with the contribution of the Geneva Academy. Uh, you know the book, you have seen the book. Um, I must say, I like this book, I like it very much, and I especially like the initial sentence by the editors. I quote, as teacher at, at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, a joint center of the Graduate Institute and the University of Geneva, we are acutely aware of the universal nature of the Geneva Convention and their crucial importance, etc., etc. The first words of the commentary are, as teachers at the Geneva Academy, therefore I don't need to further elaborate on the importance of this book for the Geneva Academy, and I hope of the importance of the Geneva Academy for this book. Uh, we are very excited to hear our prestigious panelists. Let me introduce briefly our guests, without introducing the editors, which, who are well known here, I guess. Uh, the guests are also well known, but let me introduce them in order of appearance uh, on this podium. First, we will hear Klaus Kress, who is a professor at the University of Cologne, where he holds the Chair for German and International Criminal Law, and he is the Director of the Institute of International Peace and Security. He has also been active at the international level. Among other things, he has acted as war crime expert for the Prosecutor General for East Timor. Uh, Klaus Kress is co-editor of several law journals, including the Journal of International Criminal Justice, which is also well known here, and the Journal of the Use of Force and International Law. 
Then, after a reply and some comments by the editors, we will hear uh, Jean-Marie Enkertz, Mr. Castamere Law, as you all know. I don't know if Madame Castamere Law is also in the room. Um, perhaps she is. Uh, Louis Dosvaldeck. Um, he has been legal advisor to, uh, in the ICRC legal division since nine, uh, 1969. Uh, sorry. Since 2011, he had the ICRC's project to update the commentaries to the Geneva Conventions, and it's a very good thing to have him here with us. Prior to this, he was the head of the ICRC's project on customary international law. Uh, he is the co-author of the ICRC study on the subject, which is extremely well known, uh, customary international humanitarian law, two volumes. And last but not least, Ambassador Valentin Selweger, uh, who is head of the Directorate of Public International Law and legal advisor of the Swiss Foreign Ministry. He holds a PhD from the University of Basel. He then joined the Swiss Foreign Ministry where he has served as a diplomat and has represented Switzerland in uh, different treaty negotiations, including the uh, Rome Conference on the Establishment of the International Criminal Court. Thanks to all our guests to be with us, and without further ado, I give the floor to uh, Klaus Kress. Klaus, please. Merci. Beaucoup, peut-être un mot en français, un mot de bonjour. Je suis très heureux de retourner à Genève où j'ai eu le grand plaisir d'étudier euh, et à l'université et à l'HEI, autant, et où j'ai rencontré deux professeurs que j'adore euh, jusqu'ici. Mon professeur en droit international public à l'université, à l'époque, c'était Luigi Condorelli, et je suis dans un, euh, un mood nostalgique de voir le deuxième professeur adoré, Peter Hagenmacher. C'est un tel grand plaisir d'être avec vous ici. Congratulations to uh, this splendid team of editors. What a better place in Geneva, the capital of uh, the law of armed conflicts or international humanitarian law to have these three Geneva-based professors, distinguished professors, to publish this important commentary. I have been asked to uh, offer a few remarks on um, the commentary's observations on non-international armed conflicts. And, um, well, the first thing is almost a commonplace. We all know this and we all basically agree. One of the most important, most fascinating developments of the last two decades or so is a process that may be called customary assimilation uh, of the law of non-international armed conflict to that governing international armed conflicts. But stating this, common, what is now considered a commonplace is one thing. Drawing all the necessary conclusion, discovering all the legal implications this has, this is quite another daunting, challenging. And uh, it is from this perspective that I approached not reading uh, the commentary, of course, in its entirety. I should be very honest with you. I had the benefit to look at it for three days. And these were three busy days, because in Germany, important things on other dimensions of international law were happening, which <laughs> took some time. Um, so I, but I had a careful initial look um, to see how this commentary uh, approached this challenge to conceptualize, to explain, to systemize this, these two decades of development. And the first thing I like to say that uh, you made a formal choice that I found a very, very wise one. You did not, you did no longer confine yourself to deal with the law of non-international armed conflict under the umbrella of common article three, but you have decided to include a cross-cutting section with respect to all the topics you deal with, relevance to non 
international armed conflicts, you have called this. And I think this has been a very wise choice. I have, as I said, not been reading all those cross-cutting sections, but I think it will add substantially um, to the enlightenment uh, of the reader. I have then looked a bit more closely um, to your work or the work of contributors on the, on the very concept of non-international armed conflict, including its geographical application. So all these questions which have, which have been haunting us uh, for the last time. Um, what I have discovered, not to my surprise, especially Marco Milanovic's chapter, Katja Schübel's chapter, and also Lindsay Moir's chapter, uh, a careful and nuanced, I stress these two, facets careful and nuanced opening towards the idea that a non-international armed conflict can assume transnational dimensions. But again, which is important, you have not just stated it, you have begun to circumscribe it and to um, also to somehow um, confine and restrict the consequences of that notion. I would not go so far, I have given some thought of it during this week, once Germany had decided to get directly involved in the Syrian drama, um, what that would mean for the constellation that Germany has now engaged in with Syria, with the so-called Islamic State. All those questions are in the commentary. I would say, um, you do not get, from taking all the materials together that I've looked at, you do not get a definitive answer to all those questions that I would be able to put to um, German decision makers. But, and that's what a scholarly enterprise is all about, you get most of the relevant considerations and observations on which you can build with a, um, a certain degree of intellectual energy left to yourself. Um, the consideration pertinent to build an argument. And that's um, something we should be very grateful for. And then um, I would like to stress two examples, and it cannot be more in 10 minutes than examples, two examples which have, no, before I do this, one sentence, one sentence that struck me as particularly important when I said, careful and nuanced this idea of a certain broadening of the concept of non-international armed conflict. When, what I mean by this is perhaps wonderfully captured by one sentence that you wrote, Andrew. And because I found it particularly important, I will read it out. I will read it out in the hope that I find it. When I have found the page, I will let you know <laughs> which page it is. I oh, know that's Milanovic. When I read Milanovic, I cannot find Andrew. Clapham, unrecognized. Yeah. So it is page 25, marginal note 68. The humanitarian imperative pulls us towards adopting a low threshold of violence for ensuring the humanitarian protection of the Geneva Conventions. But, and the but is important, I believe, but there is a risk that this low threshold gets misapplied to determine the existence of a right to use force in self-defense, or the application of the wider law of armed conflict, thus escalating the violence and putting even more people at risk. This is a, I believe, a fundamentally important uh, sentence and very important in perspective to the old Pictet commentary, where perhaps your but was a bit less nuanced, uh, less clearly articulated, but we need that but in our times because we have come to understand that broadening the concept of, of non-international armed conflict uh, has a, a double side, a humanitarian protection side, but also an empowering side to which we have uh, put all our critical uh, attention. That was what I wanted to add on this general 
concept. Now the two examples for uh, extremely useful, more detailed scholarly work. The first is um, part of Sarah Naki's um, commentary on the murder part of Common Article 3. Sarah Naki, distinguished colleague from Columbia Law School, and she asks um, a question in a sharpness that has been rarely asked. To what extent, if at all, this murder provision can be applied in the conduct of hostilities context? This is precisely the type of more specific legal analysis that we now need, not just say it's broadening, it's applicable and, and applauding if it is applicable, but questioning what are the reasons for and against. And she arrives after a very careful uh, scholarly analysis um, at a result that perhaps some may find intuitively problematic. Her result is the preferred choice after having duly recorded, as scholars should, all the conflicting arguments. She arrives at the conclusion the murder provision should not apply in the realm of conduct of hostilities, not because she doesn't want to accord humanitarian protection, but for very important systematic reasons to make the system, uh, or to maintain the coherence of the system. That's one um, passage that I very much recommend to your reading. And the second one is, and of course it's a, it must be an arbitrary choice, I had three days to pick and choose, uh, Laura Olson's um, chapter on internment. And here again, the most fascinating, to me, the, the most fascinating part was what current international law has to say on internment in non-international armed conflict. And what she does on two pages, I think is really a, a masterpiece in succinctness. She deals with all these uh, fundamentally difficult questions a lacuna in written international law, the question of interrelation between international humanitarian law and international human rights law. She captures all the debate about lex specialis or not, but she hesitates to draw very easy shortcut alternative decisions either or, but she comes up with what I believe is an innovative, a carefully thought through proposal. She leaves it a little bit open whether it is lex lata or emerging lex lata. Um, but that's not so important now from my scholarly perspective. I just want to flag it as an example for very fruitful, as a German I would call it dogmatic <laughs> legal uh, analysis that brings uh, our knowledge as the expectation should be in reading this commentary forward. She in the end refers the reader to the question whether in order to put this system in place, she suggests a derogation is needed under, for example, the human, European Human Rights Convention. A question, as you know, the European Court of Human Rights has decided with respect to international armed conflict, but not yet, and it will have probably soon have to give a decision on non-international armed conflict, a fundamentally important question. And now uh, I come and I close with this to my only complaint about this beautiful piece. She refers the reader, who has gotten very curious now, to Clapham. <laughs> to Clapham's chapter on derogations. There is a specific chapter, again, very wise choice to finally devote careful attention to it. Hungry to read what my distinguished colleague had written, I went to page, it was said, 702 or so it starts, and I had to recognize I was, sent, I was being sent a commentary where this chapter by Andrew Klepter, Klepter was missing. Page 700, and then it continues with 733. This has... <laughs> It's, it's just not in. It's just not in in my copy, as if you wanted to prevent me from arguing with, <laughs> with Andrew Clapton. So, uh, I can, at this stage of my reasoning, only tell you... No, it, I, it's difficult for me to indicate because the page is not in. It's, uh, so, there is 
what in other respects we call a lacuna, but a lacuna <laughs> in... Um, I hope it's just my copy. It's just my, yeah. So I, I conclude in saying I refer you, the readers, with continuing curiosity, and I'm very, very eager to read <laughs> what you have to say, uh, in, but it was certainly not the last time that I have turned to the commentary, and perhaps the editors will be generous enough to help me to the 30 missing pages. <laughs> I hope I can claim I'm seriously interested. Thank you. <laughs> you will get two pages of 733. Uh, you made me a personal pleasure because I also underlined the same very sentence by Andrew Clapp. I'm on page 25, and I completely agree that it's very important. Marco Sassoli, you want to react? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Klaus, uh, obviously in the town where Calvin was teaching, it's uh, embarrassing. Uh, to react to you because uh, to, to say I agree with you and we agree with you, we think indeed we did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so we will not do this as we are in the town of Calvin. Uh, perhaps uh, on two of the issues you were mentioning and then the big debate, international, non-international armed conflicts. First, I think, indeed, the law of non-international armed conflicts is today applicable in Germany and in France. But this does not mean, and this brings us to something fundamental in my view in the commentary, the fact that IHL applies does not yet mean that it prevails over human rights law. And so, if an activist of the Islamic State is today attacked or arrested in Köln, I think human rights law prevails. But technically, because there cannot be an armed conflict where only one side is uh, subject to the laws of war and is uh, subject to the rules of the laws of war. And therefore, if you make war in Syria, war is also in your country. But with compliance, obviously, of the laws of war and the relationship with human rights law. And the second issue, uh, where I personally must say, uh, I, was all, I changed my opinion on the Sarah Krankney's uh, point, and I disagree with her, but many people agree with her. Why would they have formulated in such detail who is protected by Article 3 common if murder was only concerning people who are in the power of the enemy? Because it, then it doesn't matter. No one may be raped, no one may be killed, no one may be tortured if in the power of the enemy. And rape and torture necessarily concern people who are in the power of the enemy. So it's only murder where it matters who is a member of an armed group who has laid down his arms and so on. Why should they do that? But this is a detail. The general issue on international and non-international armed conflict indeed implies policy issues and purely legal interpretation issues and policy questions uh, influence interpretation. The policy issue is that traditionally the humanitarians were in favor of extending, by analogy or calling it customary law, uh, the law of international armed conflict to non-international armed conflicts to obtain a better protection. And the reverse, and I appreciate very much that you mentioned this, uh, is that perhaps it doesn't uh, fit very well, and it is crowding out. And this is again a point which is important in the commentary that we always take human rights law into account. It arguably crowds out human rights law. The more IHL you have, 
the more some people, including me, would claim that some rules constitute lex specialis compared with um, uh, and rules of international human rights law. And purely technically, even a positivist like Dionisio Anzilotti, whom we should read more again, admitted that it is not only, as some people claim, states who make international law, but also logic. And this, I think there is an argument of logic that certain conduct in non-international armed conflict must be regulated by the same rules than in international armed conflict, except if there are differences between the two kinds of conflicts. And there the two of us agree that there are more differences than most of the humanitarians uh, wish. And so not only combatant and prisoner of war status, but for instance, the difficulty to determine who belongs to armed groups is different than who belongs uh, to armed forces. Uh, and obviously, occupied territories, in my view, cannot exist in non-international armed conflict. And finally, one of my preferred issues, uh, the law of non-international armed conflict has also to be realistic for armed groups, because unrealistic rules don't protect anyone. And therefore, we should always check. And this is a legal argument. This is not a policy argument. It cannot be the same rule if it cannot be respected by one of the parties of the non-international armed conflict. And this is certainly a limit to the analogy uh, customary law argument, the same law for both. Thank you. Sorry for the missing pages. Does one of the other editors want to add something now? Maybe just, yeah. Maybe. Um, uh, I'm terribly sorry that you didn't have my chapter in the book. I'd like to think it's because somewhere between Oxford and Cologne, the Secret Services thought the argument was so powerful <laughs> and so protective of those who were being accused of terrorism that um, this needed to be deleted. But I can assure you that it seems to be in all the other copies. So, so I will give the floor to Jean-Marie Encart. Thank you. And the podium. Good afternoon, everyone, and <clears throat> uh, thank you, Professor Roth, and thanks to the editors for having invited me to this uh, launch event. Um, I'm Jean-Marie Henkart, and I'm in charge of the update of the commentaries on the Geneva Conventions ICRC project. So this is also to clarify that there are two projects going on in the city of Calvin, as has been said, in Geneva. And just coincidence wants it that these two are coming to fruition uh, somewhat close in this, at the same time. This is to say this commentary by the Geneva Academy, which I uh, warmly recommend to everyone. Uh, and then at the same time, the publication next March of the first uh, update of the first Geneva Convention commentary uh, by the ICRC. There is an explanation in the forward as to why that is, that there are two projects. But I believe that these two projects are complementary. I mean, uh, this commentary is a thematic one, which is very, gives very interesting insights. So it's not a traditional, so to speak, article by article commentary on the four Geneva Conventions. It's one book dealing with the four conventions in, in one volume, whereas the ICRC commentary will be uh, volume by volume, convention by convention, and a more traditional format of the article by article commentary. It is the update of what is known as the PICTE commentaries. So the first volume should be published uh, next year in, in March, and then in subsequent years, uh, additional volumes will be published, and then we would also uh, go on with the additional protocols. So that is also a, a difference and a complementary aspect of these two commentaries. It is also complementary in the sense that, as you can read in the foreword for this commentary, contributors had total academic freedom, which is, uh, is normal, whereas the ICRC is an ICRC-sponsored Commentary, of course, and it's more a collaborative effort between 
the various contributors, which include external contributors uh, and ICRC uh, contributors. So it is slightly different uh, in nature in that, in that regard, but I think both uh, will serve us to better clarify uh, the rules of the Geneva Conventions. And I don't think it's a problem that there will be two commentaries on the Geneva Conventions. I think there are different commentaries on the ICC statute, on the ICCPR, on the European Convention on Human Rights. There have always been two commentaries on the additional protocols. And, you know, no one, I mean, that hasn't been a problem. I think it's, it's actually good because we can see, excuse me, we can see, uh, we can look at the other commentary also to see uh, what it says. So I think it's, it's very useful to have this commentary. I congratulate the editor for having accomplished this humongous task because, of course, I'm aware of the difficulties in finalizing such a publication with so many contributors and so many contributions. So I really congratulate you. And I have been asked to speak about Andrew Clapham's chapter. <laughs> so this is also, again, complimentary to Professor Kress, because he was sent a copy where that chapter was taken out, and I was given a copy where that chapter was in. No, Seriously, so I've been asked to comment on the use of human rights in the commentary, and then I looked more specifically at your chapter because it is the central one, setting out uh, the relationship between the Geneva Conventions and human rights law. The preface also makes clear uh, how important this is for the, author, for, the con uh, for the editors, excuse me, because they state the massive development of human rights law since the 1960s and international criminal law since the 1990s means that today the Geneva Conventions can no longer be viewed in isolation of these branches. And further on they then say, the development of human rights law has not only led to new interpretations of the terms of the Geneva Conventions, but has also created tensions as these two branches of law have sometimes been seen to pull in different directions. Instead of dealing with these issues only in an introductory chapter, the editors have asked each contributor to consider not only the meaning of their own set of provisions, but also how the interpretation and application of these provisions have been affected by other international humanitarian treaties, including the additional protocols, as well as by other branches of international law, human rights law and international criminal law, but also environmental law and refugee law. So I think it's, it's uh, as has been mentioned, with the cross-cutting approach to non-international armed conflict, we have the same approach here that all contributors have been asked to look how their sets of provisions uh, intersect with other branches of international law, including human rights law. This need to look at other branches of international law when interpreting a treaty uh, of course, also follows from what the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 31, says about interpretation and to make sure that branches of international law interact in a logical way and, and fit together well. And so there's human rights law, there's criminal law. As has been mentioned, there's also refugee law, environmental law. But in our case, in the, for example, in, in the second Geneva Convention, there's the Law of the Sea and various conventions administered by the International Maritime Organization for example, in the third Geneva Convention, prisoners of war are supposed to have access to tobacco, and now we have a framework convention on tobacco. So there's actually a range of treaties. Well, even the Vienna Convention on the law of treaties is adopted after the Geneva Convention. So if you, if you view the Geneva Conventions in isolation in 1949, well, most of international law that exists today didn't exist. So. There's the Vienna Convention on, on how the conventions are to be interpreted. Then you follow the human rights treaties, criminal law treaties, and so many other branches of international law that were developed. So the main chapter uh, dealing with this interrelationship uh, is the one uh, by Andrew Clapham. And I <coughs> recommend this chapter to you because it offers an in-depth analysis of this issue, and I find it interesting that it concludes to say that it cannot offer a theory of everything, of really a theory setting forth what is the relationship, because it would be too simplistic in a sense. There is no one size fit all, fits all. It depends on a number of factors, and then if you go through it and the chapter takes you through these uh, steps, you realize that indeed it is very contextual, the relationship. For example, it depends on what the subject matter is that you're dealing with. Are you dealing with detention, or are you dealing with killing or you're dealing with occupation, and then which aspect even of that, in detention, for example, is it about humane treatment 
or torture, or is it about conditions of detention or medical care, or access to tobacco, for example? And in occupation, is it about internment or taking of property, or is it about education? So you can see in each of these areas, there are different types of human rights law that apply. Then also importantly, is it international or non-international conflict? So is the relationship with the third and the fourth Geneva Convention and additional protocol one, or is the relationship with common article three and additional protocol two? Is it treaty law or is it customary law? And where do we find those human rights norms that we're talking about that we, uh, where we have an interplay with IHL? In which treaty? Is it a universal treaty? Is it a regional treaty? Is it ratified? Is it customary? So there are a lot of steps actually a person, uh, a lawyer has to go through to see how the interplay works in each specific case. And I find this very useful to be reminded of this. And then the chapter looks at different types of treaties. There are a number of human rights treaties that actually address explicitly the relationship with the Geneva Conventions. For example, the 1979 Convention Against Hostage Taking. There are some treaties that specifically refer to their applicability in human rights. For example, the Convention on the Rights of the Child or the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So these cannot even be said really to be only human rights treaties or because they have an IHL aspect to it as well. They're in a sense mixed. And then does the treaty contain, if not explicit, then implicit references to application in armed conflict, such as derogation clauses. And then, of course, that, uh, there, that's then explained in the chapter that is there, I can uh, assure you. Then there are other questions so, such as, does the, human right, uh, does the human rights law apply extraterritorially? And of course, that's a whole subject of debate. And does the human rights law apply to non-state armed groups? Because the IHL rules do. And then the question is, does it apply to uh, non-state armed groups? So in conclusion, the chapter states that it's increasingly recognized that human rights law applies in terms of armed conflict alongside IHL. And I would, of course, uh, support that conclusion. I think we're, we're gradually seeing that development coming to fruition and, and that it's now generally recognized, increasingly recognized, as you say. However, uh, the exact articulation for each and every situation is still under construction, and, and we are aware of the recent cases such as Hassan and Serdar Mohammed in relation to detention in international and non-international conflicts, where we uh, may still see some developments. So the conclusion of the chapter is then, it's contextual and it's complicated. So there is no easy answer, and I find that refreshing to say that, that it's not uh, as simple as in, for example, the in the, the paragraphs, the often cited paragraphs of the ICJ, it's a bit simplistic. And you have to go through all these steps and answer all these questions for each and every specific situation to see what you're actually dealing with. Our commentary will, uh, of course, also have to look at this. And it uh, starts on the assumption or on the basis of complementarity. Because somewhere in the introduction, you say that in various publications, people have uh, outlined different approaches, and some have called the relationship congruent, concurrent, convergent, confluent, complementary, contradictory, in competition, or even in conflict. So I would support complementary, and I think that's uh, the approach we, we've taken with respect to the relationship between IHL and human rights law in general. They complement each other because the protection afforded also by humanitarian law because the two bodies of law share this common value of protecting human life and dignity. The relationship is, however, a complex one and still subject, I agree, to further clarification and evolution. I'd also agree that it's highly contextual and therefore the interaction in each case has, depends on the issue at hand. It's not simple. It cannot be, there cannot be a simple one-size-fits-all answer. And there cannot be a sort of a general theory or it would have to be a very, uh, very uh, a theory that's developed in various details, so to speak. So therefore also our commentary will address, will not offer this general theory, we cannot offer this general theory, and we will have to look at the relationship on a case-by-case -case basis, whether we're dealing with access to tobacco or clean detention facilities or who can be interned or what is the definition of torture or what is murder, who can be targeted, and so on and so forth. 
So complementary for me means that IHL in some cases informs human rights law. For example, that arbitrary deprivation of the right to life in armed conflict has to be interpreted in light of the rules on the conduct of hostilities. Or if you like detention in the Hassan case in international armed conflict, I think takes this approach. And on the other hand, human rights law in some cases informs IHL like when we look at the definition of torture and various uh, cases that have refined what this means, we can turn to human rights law to look at the interpretations given or the right to fair trial in Common Article 3. So in closing, I would uh, really recommend this chapter to you. I think it sets forth a very good framework. I have not been able, of course, to check, to read each and every chapter now, to check how this has been reflected in the different chapters. I did read also uh, Professor Nucky's chapter on murder in Common Article 3, and I think that that is also uh, a very good chapter uh, that deals with the very important issues that you have pointed out. So we've also had to struggle with uh, this relationship. I think it is one of the more interesting aspects of updating a commentary, and that we are not aware in a sense that when we set out, I mean, not aware of how much has changed actually since 1949 and since Pictet wrote the first commentary which was published in 1952. I mean, the protocols didn't exist. Uh, the ICCPR didn't exist. The Human Rights Committee didn't exist and so on and so forth. So the ICTY had not issued any of its decisions. So there has been really a, a tremendous development in the past 60 years. And I think uh, our commentaries, your commentary and our forthcoming commentary will uh, try to capture these developments, and I think that will help to ensure better respect and better understanding of these fundamental rules in the Geneva Conventions. Thank you. Is it, it's working. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, and thank you for the compliments. Um, complementarity is indeed a word that you can use, or being complementary uh, is a very comfortable way to put it, both between the two commentaries and between the two branches, international humanitarian law and human rights law. Um, as you said, what I tried to do in that chapter is to go beyond the vague assertion that this is complementary and to say, well, it really depends which rule you're talking about, and not only which rule, but which treaty, because it could be different under the European system, under the American system, under the African system, and then which bit of IHL are we speaking about? Is it in the Geneva Conventions or the Protocol and so on? So as you say, and thank you for recognizing it, it's, it's a more detailed and nuanced approach to exactly what is happening um, in detention. I'd like to maybe address a couple of things that you, you didn't quite get to as to what we were trying to do with the commentary when we said we would take a cross-cutting approach that looked at human rights in each chapter. Often we would say to a contributor, but what about the human rights possibilities here? And what did we mean by that? So you could often find a violation of the Geneva Conventions, and there were violations which are described, but at the same time they would also be a violation of human rights, in a complementary way, if you like. And the question is, what did the author think about that? And so we encourage them not just to talk about the relationship between the two branches, but what would happen if that sort of complaint went to a human rights body. And I suppose that's one of the big uh, changes since the Pictet commentaries, that there now exist regional human rights courts, there exist the UN treaty bodies, there exist the special rapporteurs. And so I just jotted down... Um, some of the special rapporteurs reports that you will find referenced quite a lot throughout the commentary. For example, the special rapporteur on summary and arbitrary executions is cross-referenced not only in murder but in multiple other situations where you've got um, killings. And you've got a number of decisions of the European Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights where a violation of international humanitarian law has occurred, but because those courts don't judge violations of humanitarian law, they judge violations of human rights, the case is presented as a human rights case. And I think um, that is probably one of the big, I would say, value added of the book, is that not only does it explain how the Geneva Conventions work within their own regime, but how the same factual events could also be a violation of human rights, which is operating in a complementary way, as you've just heard. And therefore, you have the right to go to a forum which you wouldn't necessarily have with international humanitarian law. 
And indeed, not only can you go to an international forum, but many of the chapters will have incidents where claims have been brought before a national court. And again, you can often bring a human rights claim in a national court where you couldn't bring it if you frame it as a violation of the Geneva Conventions. So that's, again, part of the cross-cutting issues. Now, you referred to the fact that in our preface, we asked people not only to look at human rights law, but also international criminal law. And obviously, this was the responsibility of my colleague, Professor Paola Gaeta. But as we're talking about the cross-cutting issues, what I'd like to say is that Again, a value added is that when somebody had explained what the relevant provisions of the Geneva Conventions meant, we would come back to them and say, if it's violated, is it a war crime? And, of course, in the original commentaries to the Geneva Conventions, that was not really a question. It was a question for grave breaches. But for the other provisions, there was no international criminal court. There was no real prospect of people being tried transnationally for war crimes. And so you will see that there is usually at the end of a chapter a section called implementation or enforcement of the rights. And there we ask people to ruminate on whether or not this represents an individual war crime. And of course, when I was checking the table of cases, the longest table of cases, or rather the most cases that are cross-referenced in the book, are actually from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And that is where you have today a very rich seam of thinking about what is a violation of the Geneva Conventions, because nearly all of those cases, with the exception of the genocide and crimes against humanity cases, are really about the Geneva Conventions. And so that was really what we were trying to do with these cross-cutting themes, adding to Picte the cross-references to human rights throughout the book, but thinking not only of human rights as a topic, but as a possible way to get justice. And then similarly to add criminal justice throughout the book. Um, but thank you very much for reading my chapter and for the publicity that it's getting. Um, I'm very grateful. to listen to the contribution by Ambassador Zellweger. Thank you. Monsieur le Directeur, cher Robert, um, colleagues, thank you very much for allowing, allowing me to be here today. Um, Usually you would say it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. It is indeed a great honor and pleasure for me to be here because I think we are about here assisting uh, at the launch of a very important book. And frankly, when I first heard, we all knew for a few years there were two commentaries in the doc. And when I first heard that your commentary would have, as you just mentioned, a cross-cutting or a thematic approach, being a rather, rather conservative man and working for the Swiss government, which is not always a good combination, <laughs> I thought, well, what new uh, insights would that bring? And when I looked through the book, I was really convinced about the approach. And not only because, as you say, you can address cross-cutting issues, also to a certain extent because you can leave aside some issues that you have to address in a commentary and that the ICRC will have to address in its commentary that are not, to say, diplomatically of a general interest because, for example, all these conventions have final clauses and this kind of stuff, but also because the thematic approach allows you to really group the issues and that makes it much more readable than if you have to base it, uh, base it on the structure of the conventions. And there is one thing that always strikes me. Uh, of course, you could say today we have uh, more complex conflicts, so we have to think about the, uh, the body of law that is IHL. But if I look at this audience also, I'm not sure uh, whether we would have so many people, so many of you, say 10, 15 years ago. Because IHL, I think, over the past few years has also gained uh, a lot of new interest, and that certainly is good. And all these newly interested, uh, this newly interested audience will now be well served with 
this uh, commentary. So really congratulations. I was asked to say a few words about um, compliance. And let me start with a general uh, observation. Sometimes it's good to have us on some spare time and to browse the internet. I was recently asked to uh, speak at an event of the Institut de Droit International, and I went through their webpage, and I saw that uh, Gustave Moignier was one of their founding members. What I didn't know was his intention in uh, contributing to the Institut de Droit International. As you remember, he was also one of the instigators of the 1864 uh, Gen Geneva Convention, the first convention. And after the Franco-Prussian War, 1870-71, he was so frustrated by the total lack of compliance in this war of the conventions that he came up with the idea of founding the Institut de Droit International to really look into, and that was the first goal, look into the issue of compliance with international law. So the issue is not new. And um, the issue has been there for a while. We all know that it's probably one of the, the weaknesses of the Geneva Conventions. And if you look at the commentary, if I remember correctly, you subdivide it in seven chapters. And I think your uh, coverage of the issue is probably more than complete or extensive. Uh, I think many of us would not have been able to subdivide it in seven chapters. And I think your choices make a lot of sense if you go really through them. And there are a few indications that are very interesting, and that's one of the other advantages of the commentary, because as editors, you ask the contributors to add at the end a chapter on critical assessment. What is the opinion of the individual commentator? And I thought these chapters, um, some of them were the most helpful and the most interesting. And if you look at them, for example, the chapter that deals with the ICRC, indicates Ratna Giladi, it indicates that states, so to speak, outsource their um, responsibility they have for compliance to the ICRC. Now, we all know that this has worked so far, it's a good idea, but it's still an outsourcing. And Giladi Ratna, they regret it and say states would have to take more responsibility if uh, really compliance was to improve. Another chapter that um, was a bit, how do you say, a less um, encouraging lecture, if I may say, was the chapter that Paula uh, contributed. As Robert has mentioned, I was involved in the uh, Rome uh, statute negotiations and I worked for a while at the court. And of course, my hope was that you would say in your chapter there was a, an important contribution of the ad hocs and probably of the future ICC to uh, um, the jurisprudence on grave breaches, because I think that the uh, criminalization of uh, the uh, IHL is probably one of the most um, powerful compliance uh, contributions to further compliance over the last year. And I was uh, a bit discouraged to read your very well-reasoned chapter that this is not really the case, so we all have to put our hopes on the ICC. One last remark I would make on a individual contribution is the one of uh, Jérôme Dantin on reprisals. And I thought it was particularly interesting because we often get a forget comprisals as a possible compliance mechanism. And Dantin uh, argues that we should get rid of them. And he has, of course, a very convincing argument. He, he says you should not counter one violation with another which is very interesting. The other interesting fact I thought in his contribution was that to my knowledge, and I hope it's right, he is the only one who says, well, compliance is not working. We really have to go for a big institution. We have to create an institution. So it's interesting. It's not one of the contributors talking about the existing mechanisms, IHFSC, inquiry mechanism, or I don't know, even protecting powers, they're all in the book, and it's very interesting to read about them, but it's the one writing about reprisals who says we need an institution. Now, and he even goes into saying what the institutions uh, could 
address. We all know that the idea of a big institution, let's call it that way, is not a new one. It has been mentioned at the 49 uh, negotiations. Interestingly, if you look at the Millennium Report of the UN Secretary General, you will also find it. And you will also find the um, study of the ICRC dated 2011, which uh, was a follow-up to an extensive work on compliance mechanism in 2003. The study they published 2011 on the protection of victims of armed conflict, which came to the conclusion, and you may remember this was after years of di uh, discussions, uh, to what extent is IHL outdated. We had the US administration who argued that IHL is no longer up to its task, and the uh, ICRC looked into this and came to the conclusion that, in fact, it was only four areas that needed some work, and one of them, of course, the most important one was uh, compliance. I make this remark about compliance, also the big institution, because if you allow me, one of the feelings I had when looking at the commentary, and I say these seven, seven subdivisions, it reminded me of this story of the five men who are in a dark room trying to uh, identify an elephant. And one of them says, oh, it's long and soft. And the other says, no, 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 not at all. It's very hard. And the third one was, no, it's thin. But none of them sees the elephant. They all see part of it. And reading through the different chapters on compliance, you get a very, very clear sense that exactly the same thing is happening uh, on the Geneva uh, Conventions. And in that case, it's also a political document because it really shows the lacuna, the glaring big lacuna, so to speak, the elephant in the room, that we do not have the big institution. I mentioned the report of the ICRC 2011. On the basis of that report, the Red Cross and Red Crescent Conference that was held in the same year decided that Switzerland and uh, the ICRC should be entrusted with strengthening compliance. Fortunately, we didn't get the mandate to build the big institution, but strengthening compliance. And second element, which is also interesting in the, in the context of the commentary, it had to be state-driven. Do you remember I mentioned that Giladi Ratner said states are outsourcing. Now in 2011, they say quite the contrary. We want to take more responsibility, and they gave us this mandate. Now, how do you go about that? You have the four Geneva Conventions, you have the Protocol 77, and then you want to build something. Ideally, the something is binding, the something would intervene in ongoing armed conflicts and all of that. We all know that if we went for that thing in a meaningful manner, we would have had to uh, negotiate a treaty or an agreement, fourth, fifth protocol. The difficulty with that is, as I mentioned, not only is the idea a very old one, it has been attempted in the past, even if we succeeded, and I personally am convinced that we would not succeed, but even if we did, what would happen? We would still have to have 196 countries to ratify that agreement. Now, I think we could wait for a long time to have this happen. And during that long time, nothing is going to happen, or not much is going to happen if we ever get there. So the choice we made, the ICRC in Switzerland, was to say um, we will have to address the whole range of issues. It's not only about compliance, about the different mechanism. We should get the IHFFC working, this fact-finding commission that exists for the last 25 years but never had a mandate. We have to look at it in a more holistic manner. And if you look at the whole thing, you will also realize that there is a glaring vacuum at the heart of the so-called Geneva system. And this is not to say that the ICRC is not doing its work. This is to say that the ICRC works marvelously, but the vacuum comes from the total absence of states. States have no say whatsoever. The state parties to the Geneva, uh, Geneva Convention, no say whatsoever concerning their, uh, the issues that pertain to their, the one bond that is common to them, the Geneva Conventions. If you look at modern treaty regimes, you will see that all of them 
have a conference of state parties, assembly of state parties, or something like that. The Geneva Conventions do not. What has happened in the meantime, because there is a need, and I refer to this increased interest and the increased pertinence of this body of law, there is a need to discuss these issues, and they have been discussed in other fora. Now, these fora, most of them are very um, good fora, but they're fragmented, and they follow different standards, they have different interests and all of that. So we thought the first approach to this whole idea of strengthening the compliance would be to create, so to speak, to build a center for the whole thing. And that is what we are about to do. We had uh, nine meetings of states over the past four years, and we came to the conclusion that there may be a consensus among states to, uh, from now on, um, organize yearly meetings to discuss matters pertaining to the Geneva Conventions. Now, what could these discussions entail? They will certainly have a thematic nature. You know that many, for example, UN bodies, the Security Council, for example, would discuss thematic issues pertaining to IHL civilians in, in armed conflict, children in armed conflict, etc., etc. Uh, we could have also this kind of debate. We would create like a central and common platform to discuss IHL issues among the state parties to the Geneva Conventions. And perhaps at one stage, this center will also be recognized as the center um, to discuss these issues, which is not the case today, but it may be in the future. The second feature that may come up in these discussions is a reporting system. And this reporting system, again, will be non-contextual. Uh, uh, states may submit their national reports, but it, we will not discuss individual reports, but we will discuss a generic report on the state of implementation of the Geneva Conventions best practices. There may be a need for technical assistance on certain issues. And I would mention, for example, Switzerland not having been involved in armed conflict for quite a while now. There are things that we have simply forgotten how to do. And it would be interesting to learn from others how they deal with these issues. Today, we could not do it, be it the ICRC would be in a position to do it in a rather confidential manner. We could do it on a bilateral basis, and in the future we may have a multilateral forum to discuss these matters. And to give, so to speak, also breath, to breathe, to breathe life into the Geneva Convention between states and to do it also in a more public manner. What are the next steps? We will have the next Red Cross and Red Crescent uh, conference next Tuesday. So the four yearly conference will start on next Tuesday, and this is one, if not the big issue on the table. There is a resolution that is the outcome of the uh, joint process between the ICRC and Switzerland. And there has been a Russian proposal submitted yesterday that is, to a certain extent, a counter-proposal. And we will then see next week what we will get and how far we will get. But I'd like to close on a more political observation. The proposal as it is now on the table is, and I say this frankly, is a rather soft one. It's a voluntary mechanism that is based on voluntary contributions, that will not be put up, uh, in a position to take binding decisions, and still, there is not a tremendous, but there is serious resistance among states. And we will see next week what happens if states can consent to going this next step, or whether they would like us to stay back. If they, do, if they choose the latter solution, I think it would also be a testimony to, the, um, to a great reticence to strengthen the compliance of IHL. And therefore, it is also to a certain extent, although it has been criticized by some as a small step, I still think even as a small step, it is a critical text, test of the willingness of states how far they wish to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does it work?
Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Ambassador Zedweger, for your comments. Uh, and it's, of course, a very crucial issue, the one of uh, implementation and compliance uh, of the Geneva Conventions in general and international humanitarian law. Um, and necessarily in the, comment, in the commentary, we decided, of course, to cover the mechanisms uh, which are in the Geneva Conventions uh, to be commented upon specifically. And uh, my chapter on grave breaches, of course, was related to the uh, criminal responsibility and showing from grave breaches of the Geneva Convention. This is true that I was not particularly uh, optimistic about uh, the possibility from at least so far the international criminal tribunals to give um, contribution to um, clarification of those provisions for the fact that in one way the ICTY was so progressive uh, in its Tadic decision that it decided that the, the, the serious violations of the laws of one conflict could have covered uh, war crimes independently from the classification of the conflict and therefore very little grave breaches cases were brought before the ICTY and this means that the ICTY jurisprudence has clarified, but not as much as we would have expected at the beginning of the establishment of the tribunal uh, on the clarification of the substantive obligations uh, um, with grave breaches. And the uh, ICTR, of course, was not having grave breaches, and the ICC so far uh, has not yet uh, used uh, the grave breaches um, charge, as it could. It depends on the kind of conflicts which will come. Uh, under the uh, ICC jurisdiction. Therefore, I was a bit, uh, let's say, um, not very much optimistic about what has happened so far in terms of the clarification. Um, when it comes, however, with the general issue or to what extent uh, the criminal law uh, could be a useful tool um, on the uh, implementation of hum international humanitarian law, I do tend to say that too much emphasis, perhaps, has been put on criminal law. I do agree that there has been a tremendous development. Uh, the uh, development of international criminal law, of course, is also paying my salary in one way. So, of course, I cannot but be very enthusiastic about uh, this development. I've built my whole academic career on international criminal law, and therefore, I truly understand the importance of this branch of international law. However, I think I can say, without being accused of bias against international criminal law, that we have forgotten an important piece uh, of the picture, namely state responsibility and all consequences deriving from state responsibility, which include not only reparation, include also guarantees of non-repetition. And indeed, in the, in the commentary, what we have there is that every contributor has been asked uh, to also uh, develop on legal consequences uh, when it came uh, to a violation of the provisions that we are commenting upon. And it was quite striking to me, but not surprised at all, that most of them, when they had to ruminate about the legal consequences, they were speaking of war crimes, which is, of course, important. But when we were encouraging them, okay, sure, there may be the criminal responsibility of the individual committing the violation, but what about the state to which the individual behavior can be attributable? What about the mechanisms or the reparation or the guarantees of no repetition? And they had very little to say, apart from repeating that state responsibility is codified partially in the ILC articles on state responsibility and so on and so forth. So I think that's a quite an important aspect that we shall not forget. Uh, and therefore, I tend to say that international criminal law component cannot be the only solution or the only way go. And I'm sure that Ambassador Zellweger agrees with me that it's an, an important piece of the puzzle, but cannot be the only one, because criminal justice is necessarily selective, because it depends on the evidence. Uh, even at the International Criminal Tribunal, it will be necessarily selective. Uh, and then whether or not this will create a general deterrence is something to be said. I think that states, if they start paying reparation uh, when they are responsible for violations of the Geneva Conventions, they will take it more seriously into account what they will do in the future because it will come 
under their pockets, uh, instead of uh, uh, finding one, one, two, three most responsible. But that's that's just to give you uh, at least a sort of justification of my um, not too great enthusiasm uh, about only international criminal law as the solution. Um, uh, I think that in any case, the Swiss ICRC initiative is a very crucial one indeed. And uh, coming to the relaxed, uh, rela uh, uh, the, the states not being enthusiastic uh, in perhaps participating, um, I'm not surprised again. I do think there may be a very good legal basis in Common Article 1 uh, to participate in the establishment of such implementation uh, mechanism because after all states have become party and they've taken an obligation under Common Article 1 to promote and ensure compliance uh, uh, with the Geneva Conventions and therefore perhaps uh, to contribute to such a mechanism could be uh, seen as a legal obligation for them. Um, I don't think that I have much to say, uh, but to say that of course implementation has been uh, a crucial um, subject that also our contributors have taken into account. And in particular, uh, Jerome Demtin in his chapter on reprisals uh, was a bit struggling uh, because uh, the uh, reprisals that are prohibited under the Geneva Conventions, so, rightly so, then they leave a vacuum. Uh, what else then can be done at the state level if a state cannot react by reprisals? Is it sufficient to the grave breaches provision to promote compliance during the armed conflict? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Does one of you want to add something, Valentin? One, one remark, perhaps, and I, of course, fully agree with uh, Paula. I would just add to it that we should never forget that the ICC is not just the ICC. The ICC is part of a system, and the ICC, without complementarity, is not the system. And I have some hopes, you could say naive, but some hopes that the ICC, through its complementarity, will also um, bring states to better implement their respected the uh, obligations on grave breaches that they have to criminally sanction them. And uh, we see all these discussions about, for example, uh, the so-called impunity gap, which means the cases that cannot be addressed in individual situations because the ICC just simply doesn't have the means. But there are now more discussions than we ever had on how to address these gaps. Uh, gaps through hybrid, uh, hybrid tribunals, national uh, tribunals, and all of that, and how to uh, support or assist these tribunals. So I do think that it could be the trigger for a, uh, an important uh, development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to close? Yeah. Uh, perhaps one observation about the significance or the present state of affairs in, in international criminal justice. I think the what we witness now are the consequences of completely irreal, perhaps surreal expectations that this enterprise has been suffering uh, from the very beginning. And I have been thinking about this in 1998 already. This enterprise has been overloaded by expectations that with a glimpse of realism uh, should never have been. Enterprise. For example, this idea as if international criminal justice could be a cure on its own to the wealth of problems we are having. A criminal lawyer would never have such an illusion in the power of, of criminal law. But there are um, a number of um, organizations around that have uh, been contributing to this overloading. And now we are, so to speak, witnessing what... Uh, Lubin has been, I think, quite pertinently called the end of the honeymoon. Yes. The end of the honeymoon, so just a, a, a confrontation with the reality. And also with the reality of a bulk of problems which are not due to imperfections uh, of the drafting of the statutes, but which are, I think, absolutely inevitable. If a system is put in place, uh, a comprehensive system of justice from substantive law, including procedural law, which has, despite all the merits of the ad hoc tribunals, not been fully tested, the procedural law is, in important respects, a new 
attempt to combine elements of different legal families. It is not just a copy of what has been uh, tested before. So who could um, seriously, with a sense also of history, uh, expect that after 20 years or 10 years, uh, this enterprise would be flourishing without problem. We, and we will discover, I, I um, predict this, we will discover more serious uh, challenges we have to overcome. So um, being taught by uh, Peter Hagenmacher and the, the, the historic dimension of broader developments in international, this slow incorporation of international criminal justice as one new element in a complex overall system, and this is a very basic statement, will take a lot of time and it's not, we are far too early in time to reach um, uh, more than very, very provisional uh, conclusions. A little bit of uh, patience after these 10 years, I think, is, is well required and also a matter of perspective. Despite all those problems, also realistically, um, I would not belittle, also in terms of clarification or contribution to the clarification of substantive law, I would not belittle the uh, achievements that have been made over that time, with all the challenges still before us. So let's just um, take a more relaxed um, approach to it. We are in the midst of a fascinating process and the end is difficult to predict. Yeah. <laughs> yes, just to add on to that positive note at the end, um, because we all know this famous statement by Lars hirsch Ladopacht, if international law is at the vanishing point of law, and the law of war is at the vanishing point of international law. Would we still say that today? That is the question. I mean, if you see the developments I just listed since 1949 and where we're now, I believe that I agree with you. We're at this exciting moment of, of many developments. And if we see how international humanitarian law is now discussed, debated, clarified, including uh, through this commentary, I think with the existence of the uh, ICC and with uh, the discussions on compliance, I think that we have to look at it in a larger perspective and that today international humanitarian law is no longer at least at the vanishing point of international law. Thank you. We won't go beyond two because it's on the program and the three editors would like to conclude three minutes all. Shall we begin with Marco? Oh, she wants. <laughs> no, not to conclude. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so. You go. okay. Well, um, thank you. I just wanted to say something about the Geneva Conventions, <laughs> which should make some people think, including in this room. You know, the Geneva Conventions were adopted in 1949, when there was already the Cold War. The Soviet Union was represented by Stalin. And they were able to adopt treaties, which in our work during the last five years, we had the impression that these treaties for international armed conflicts are quite well adopted, and the situation would be totally different if they were complied with. And for non-international armed conflicts, believe me, the millions of people suffering from violations in Syria, in South Sudan, in Ukraine, would be in a totally different situation if Article 3 common was respected and perhaps some of the suggestions of analogies uh, and so on. And the sad thing, and I think states and state representatives, including in this room, should be profoundly ashamed that today it's no longer possible to adopt such treaties, be it next week at the International Conference, Ambassador Zellweger would not even dare to dream about a treaty. And the other issue, the protection of detainees in non-international armed conflict, no one even dreams to have a treaty. How is it possible 
that with all this progress, today we are not able to adopt, which, um, to get from states what they were ready to adopt in 1949. And don't tell me it was only about international armed conflict. For instance, Article 3 common. The, the simple sentence in case of armed conflict, not of an international character, each party to the conflict, capital P, it means also the terrorists, if they are an armed group, have obligations, but necessarily also rights. And an impartial humanitarian body, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, may offer its services to the parties capital P, that was Stalinist Soviet Union accepting it, Burma accepting it. Today, they do not want to speak about it. You cannot have an initiative where you even, Ambassador Zellweger is prohibited to dream about armed groups. <laughs> Something is profoundly wrong in our system. I just ask for a right to reply because you, <laughs> you sp because you speak about my personal feelings and my dreams. <laughs> I'm not long. Marco, just look at the list of participants in 49. There were 50 states. Today we have 196. I think that's a response. Thank you very much. It's very so. easy. But Stalinist Soviet Union. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> After, after, after Condorelli and Hagenmacher, then Stalin, so who comes next? <laughs> That's why I was suggesting to have Marco concluding. Uh, and now I don't know what to say, apart from that I'm happy and relieved that it's over. Um, it was a great pleasure to work with my, with my colleagues. Uh, they had to bear with me. Uh, without Marco, we would have never finished, that's for sure, mm -hmm. uh, because he was adopting the German way I was hiding from me for many times because I was late in delivering my chapters or doing my job. Uh, but apart from that, uh, of course, Andrew will then thanks perhaps so all the people who have given a contribution. I just wanted to say a few words quickly about the choice of having a thematic commentary because it is uh, complementary to the ICRC. It has been... Uh, and one way to escape uh, boring provisions, perhaps, or those that we didn't consider to be crucial, at the same time uh, to make it more as an academic book, more readable, and to group issues. But this has also proved immensely difficult in terms of cross references between chapters, because uh, you can group, but then people, in order to be speaking in one same commentary, they should perhaps cross references between chapters. And Marco has done a marvelous job in helping the team in finding these cross-references. And the index was really a nightmare. Uh, uh, I have to say in presence of RUP. Um, and I took, I think, at least three weeks uh, to try to redo the index, because in a commentary like that, you want to have a discussion, I don't know, on, I don't know, on rape, not only on the chapter in rape, but rape is necessarily mentioned in, our, in, other, in other chapters and the same for other provisions. In order to make it readable, it was really uh, quite uh, heavy stuff. I am sure that some, some, some entries are missing in the index. However, the Swiss ICS initiative is there three times. So, I mean, this at least we got it. And that's it. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, I don't think I will do another commentary. <laughs> no. You, you, you forget to mention that we are publishing in a couple of weeks or months the commentary to the Joint Air Principles. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, I'm trying to escape again. I'm, I'm hiding from my colleagues. Um, I'm going to stand up to do the thanks so I can see the people on this side. But also I wanted to suggest that when you stand in front of a, a glamorous and well-dressed audience like this <laughs> and you start your remarks, I would like to thank the Academy. You're, you're supposed to be holding a little um, gold statuette. <laughs> uh, 
but I, I would like to thank the Academy and Professor Robert Roth um, for organizing this, but also for supporting the project all the way through. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without the structure of the Academy and without his support, and most importantly, without the support of Iris van der Heyden. who did an absolutely fantastic job over the last couple of years pulling this whole thing together. Not only did she have to chase the authors, but she had an eye for detail in going through the chapters, finding the cross-references, making a coherent whole out of what otherwise would have been 75 separate chapters. So we're extremely grateful, Iris. Um, without you, we would not be standing here. Um, the other uh, assistant editors I will mention, of course, are Tom Hake, Annie Hilton, Julia Grignon, and Ilya Nusov, who's with us this evening, and also a special thanks to Steve Wilkinson, who worked on the original breakdown with Professor Paula Gaeta. Um, another word to our sponsors, the Swiss um, Foreign Affairs Ministry, in particular Ambassador Zellweger, but also his predecessor, Ambassador Paul Sager, who was the first person to hear about this project when um, we went to see him in Bern. Um, also, I have to thank the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, in particular the Law Department, Professor Andrea Bianchi, but also the Director, Professor Philippe Bioran, and the Law Faculty at the University of Geneva, both its deans, Dean Bove, Dean Chapius as well. Um, and then maybe lastly, and perhaps um, importantly, because Oxford University Press are here represented, Meryl Alstein, who's seen the project through um, from its conception right through the birth um, to the day we are um, here today. Thank you, Meryl, and to John Louth, Bryony Riles, and Jenny Payne, who all helped um, to put it together. Um, this is beginning to sound like an Oscar um, ceremony <laughs> speech, and I make no apologies for that. There are a lot of people um, who I need to thank who went into this. Of course, all the contributors, some of you may be watching on the webcast, and perhaps um, lastly, my two co-editors, with whom it was a great pleasure to work. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Paola. Thank you very much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Andrew, so much for congratulations. So uh, we invite you to have a coffee and some sandwiches on the ground floor and for the ones who uh, may stay with us to have the discussion with the students in the room B just uh, uh, on the side and just to um, invite you to come to the next launching uh, under the auspices of the Geneva Academy on the 10th of December next Thursday at 6.30 in L'Auditoire Jacques Fremont, the launching of the War Report 2014, which also will be live streamed. I add that the, the event of this afternoon will be live streamed as well. Thank you and have a nice afternoon.
On a commencé à se prendre des gens sur la stream. On est aussi très sont tired. I'm an old woman. You know, I have two students who followed me from Jakarta. Really? Former students from Bokori. I have to tell you about something, but I will tell you at the same time. everybody. I'm very happy to see so many of you here for this discussion with the co-editors of the commentary. You guys could sit in the front rows. Yes, um, <laughs> we won't eat you. Um, <laughs> for those of you who didn't attend the launch next door that just happened, or for those of you who are following us online, I'll just present um, the co-editors of the commentary. We have Professor Andrew Clapham, who teaches at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies and at the Geneva Academy. We have Professor Gaeta, who teaches at the Graduate Institute and at the University of Bocconi in Milano. And we have Professor Marco Sassoli, who teaches at the University of Geneva and uh, at the Geneva Academy. Um, the ideas of... And? Oh. No? <laughs> and, and the idea of this discussion is that you can ask questions uh, to the co-editors about the commentary, um, a specific chapter or just a book in general. We also got one question from Twitter that we received during the last session, and we also have written questions that students submitted before. Um, I hope that the discussion will be as lively as possible, and um, I think you students are very lucky to have this book published in the middle of your academic year, because it's surely going to help you for exams, and I think my colleagues teaching assistants like myself are also very happy because it's going to make our job much easier next semester. Um, with this, I think we could start with um, the first question, maybe a question from, from maybe the question that we got on Twitter. And it was a question that was originally addressed to Professor Kress, who left, but I think if... if yeah. Oh, he's here. Yes. Ah, th then it was a question, it was a question for you. And it was um, whether you had any thoughts or opinion about the German position as to the intervention in Syria that was just recently decided. <laughs> <laughs> Do you also have a big question? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately not. So is it a question in terms of uh, the law and the use of force, in terms of the law of armed conflicts, in terms of constitutional law? What is the, um, in order to save time, what, what is the... Twitter only allows for 140 characters. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think the question is as precise, but I can read it okay. to you if no, you no. like. Okay, no, no, then if it's not precise, no okay. need to, to read it. Uh, then I'll try to give you... Um, um, a short response. So, the, the official German position on the use of force is similar to, the, uh, to that of the coalition partners, Germany now being a member of a coalition, um, that the action is based on the right of collective self-defense, um, which implies that uh, Germany takes the view that a non-state armed attack may trigger uh, the right of self-defense under Article 
1951. Um, Germany is alluding to the non-state armed attack against Iraq, which was the basis for Allied action since summer 2014. But if I read the official government memorandum correctly, this is now complemented by a case of collective self-defense to the benefit of France. Um, following, as you may have uh, read the first application in history of Article 42, Paragraph 7, so the European uh, pendant uh, to Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. There is not much uh, explanation uh, on this legal construct. I would have liked to see a little bit more, but that's uh, what has been uh, made public so far. Um, nothing, as far as I can see at this moment of uh, at this moment in time, on the implications in terms of uh, the law of armed conflict, conflict qualification, and all these um, repercussions. Perhaps at this moment in time, there is a hope that because of the fairly limited involvement, not so many of the um, very hard issues will arise. But we will see whether this hope works uh, and whether perhaps the government will not have to get into the substance a bit more detailed. Uh, I expect Germany to, that, but that's just a private expectation as a law professor, not, <coughs> nothing, not an inside view. I expect Germany to write a letter to the president of the Security Council, as Article 51 requires shortly. You will know that per, today we have the concluding parliamentary debate, so as we speak, German Parliament is to make its final decision. And if this decision will go as expected, um, then probably this letter will be, it, it might be drafted already, but it will be sent uh, to New York next week. The perhaps most daunting issue, and I will not go into detail because that may be of lesser interest to this audience, um, as I see it, the most uh, daunting issue is that of constitutional law because we have a fairly complex um, constitutional court case law on possible constitutional legal basis for Germany's use of force. Uh, here again, the, the government has come forward with an official legal case which is based on the idea that, this, that Germany is taking part in a collective security action, but I say no more than uh, that this is very likely to create um, a lively scholarly debate in the, in the near future. So the constitutional debate is perhaps the most challenging part of it. Just a brief answer to flag the issues. Thank you. Um, perhaps we could take one question from the room. Robert James Parsons, journalist and student again. I have a question for Paul Gaita, uh, more of a remark which I hope she'll be able to comment on. And, but first I thank her for her exemplary, lucid articulation. It's always a pleasure to hear her speak because she is so lucid and so articulate. In any event, you mentioned earlier the importance of state actors as opposed to simply criminal law. However, I see the state as a mechanism, a structure being used by individuals. And I think, for example, under the Bush regime, where you have people such as John Yu, John Bybee, David Addington, um, Rumsfeld, and so on, using the state to create what they claim is law, dismissing the whole question of torture, denouncing the Geneva Conventions as quaint, saying they don't apply, with no real solid backing or grounds in any sort of uh, jurisprudence, much less uh, international treaty law. And they used the state to create a whole st structure of torture. And we know now hundreds of thousands of people were subjected to this. There were 54 other states then that agreed to participate in the rendition program. But these were not states, as we think of them, directed by governments. They were states being manipulated by individuals within the governments or within the state structure, and perhaps not even within a government, more, more likely within a, uh, a, an intelligence service or the military. 
And so I would contend that the, the individuals and therefore the criminal law would take precedence over states' obligations because the states will do only what those in charge of them allow them to do. And if you don't go after the individuals, you will have continually individuals using the state for criminal activities. Could you comment on that, please? And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and not only for the compliment that I'm happy to accept. I don't know if I'm lucid, um, <laughs> but I will try to keep it in mind. Um, certainly, you, I think that you put your finger on the most complex issue of the relationship between state responsibility and individual criminal liability in international law. And you rightly point out that states, they do become criminal in one way, in the sense that they develop criminal policies because they are manipulated by those in power. And you know better than I that Nuremberg was built upon this postulate, okay, that crimes are committed by men and not by abstract entities. It is by only punishing those individuals that we can enforce international law. And I pretty agree with this comment. And I certainly agree that criminal law is the mature response to those criminal behavior. However, my caveat is that criminal law must be then equal for all. Okay? So we can get rid of state responsibility if we may or are sure to build up a system of criminal justice which will be applicable against al-Bashir, Barack Obama, Putin, Matteo Renzi and all the others. Okay? What I do not like of the criminal law response is that it is currently apparently perceived or used in a Nuremberg paradigm only against some. And therefore, I think therefore, we can get rid of state responsibility only if we become mature enough to make criminal law applicable to all. Until we reach that time, I insist that if we do not have the Rumsfeld punished, okay, or for others for torture and abuses in Abu Ghraib, I would like at least the US paying reparation to victims and ensure that in the future it will not occur again under the law of state responsibility. I don't think that we have to get rid of it so quickly, the state responsibility paradigm. I think we are in the middle phase where we must keep the two, but to play importance on one shall not forget the importance of the other. That's my answer. Thank you. We, um, we received questions from students beforehand, and I think we can start with one of those. Um, the first one is, um, are the authors or co-editors taking interpreta a progressive interpretation of the law, or do the interpretations stick to what the authors or co-editors think the law is right? Um, thank you. It's an excellent question, uh, and it's something which I think the editors were quite vigilant about throughout. So I think it's fair to say that all of the chapters apply the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties rule of interpretation. Now you heard just now that <coughs> strictly speaking the Vienna Convention doesn't apply to the Geneva Conventions, but as you know it's a, it's a customary rule now. And so we were careful that each of the terms that we were interpreting or the authors were interpreting in the Geneva Conventions looked at the plain meaning of the words, but of then, course, of course, in their context, and most importantly, in the light of the object and purpose of the treaty. So to the extent that authors developed what the meaning should be in order to protect the victims of war, because that is what the Geneva Conventions are supposed to do, you could say it's progressive. But in legal interpretation theory, it's not progressive in the sense of bending the meaning of the words or taking things beyond what states accept through their practice the words mean. Now having said that, and it was mentioned uh, previously but I would highlight it, we did ask nearly every author to have a section which was called critical assessment. And in that section, authors were free to explain what I've already explained is the law, here is where I think the law should go. Now that might mean that you need a new text or a new interpretation or a new treaty, but uh, we were quite strict in separating out, <coughs> if you like, the lex latter from the lex legge ferenda. Um, so there I would say we were pretty strict. Um, there are some, 
areas where clearly the existing framework of the Geneva Conventions were not adequate to provide the sort of protection that people thought should be provided. And there we encouraged authors to go on to say how they thought the lacunae should be filled. And in some cases, as you've heard, it was, for example, human rights stepping in to protect detainees in non-international armed conflict. Mm -hmm. There were other areas uh, I can think of which relate to definitions of torture or definitions of inhumane and degrading treatment where the interpretation was with regards to the existing interpretation under human rights law. So I wouldn't call that progressive. I would just say that since 1949, there has been state practice and there is a new context. And therefore, the interpretation which is given takes that into account. So I would say it's rather conservative. Thank you. Is there another question from, from the floor? Hello. Um, just for the ones who haven't met me before, I'm a PhD student here at the Institute and I have the enjoyment every Wednesday to have a, first a class with Professor Goethe and then a class with Professor Clapham. But um, I'm especially asking now Professor Sassoli, um, if you could expand a little bit on the argument you made in your final statement in the previous discussion. Because I found the, um, the thing you said very interesting and uh, it was a very passionate speech. But I'm wondering if it's true that um, the world has just gotten more complex because we have now 200 states or if also this 50 states which negotiated the original Geneva Convention wouldn't do such a thing today, especially with looking um, of giving rights and duties to non-state actors, um, considering that the state sovereignty and the uh, has recently become more and more important in a lot of international discussions. Is this the main reason why states wouldn't agree on something like this because they don't want to have any mentioning of these non-state actors or is it more really that there are 200 governments who would have to agree and it's just too complex by now? Thank you. Well, probably Ambassador Zelviga is right that his point is also a point. But I insist that my point is also a point that <laughs> Um, those who make pro the real problems today uh, for the conference next week are for one development uh, Russia and for the other the United States. Both states were present uh, in 1949 and uh, you know the military perhaps uh, something very depressing for law students the problem is there are too many lawyers to, around today who were trained in a way to foresee problems. You know, I, I experienced military lawyers, mostly in Anglo-Saxon countries, sorry, uh, who <laughs> foresee always, okay, if we put this into the convention, there is a possibility that one day we will be in an armed conflict on the Antarctica, and there we cannot apply the local law of Antarctica, and therefore we don't have a legal basis for detaining people, therefore we don't do this. If they had had this approach in 1949, the Third Geneva Convention on Prisoners of War, which applies from the moment on when the prisoner is captured, foresees all kinds of rights, which you cannot immediately uh, respect once you have captured. But you have to interpret rules reasonably. And imagine if at that time there had been these uh, military lawyers who would have said, I can imagine a situation where we can't comply with this and therefore don't accept it or accept it at best of the best practice. Um, this is a factor, and then there is another sad, uh, sorry that I am pessimist, but my friend Robert knows that I am always. Um, <laughs> in 1949, and I would appeal to the historians among you to write about this, 1949, in my view the delegates were still impressed of the Second World War, and they were ready to say, OK, we started the Cold War, but here is an issue we cannot play with. Because four years ago, 
our soldiers and our civilians in occupied territories were subject to this, and therefore a miracle. But you know, like the Rome Statute is also a miracle for other reasons. But it worked. Uh, while already in 1977 it was much more difficult. It took much more time and so on. And today we are in a particularly uh, low development, unfriendly atmosphere, at least for humanitarian law, because it's not true for all. I mean, the arms trade treaty could be adopted. Huh? And in my view, there are even too many new rules in some uh, fields like financial regulation, which are adopted in a very untransparent way and suddenly binding on everyone, but you will say, I'm Swiss and therefore biased on this. But it's astonishing that in humanitarian law, it's not possible to make uh, in strict humanitarian law, because for me, obviously, the arms trade treaty has an impact on humanitarian law and can help to get respect of humanitarian law, but it's not a typical humanitarian law treaty. So in pure humanitarian law, it is astonishing that this is no longer possible. And perhaps uh, both Switzerland and the ICSC made a mistake that they didn't, didn't try to get it through p mobilizing public opinion. And I wouldn't have the preconceived ideas that uh, in the states of the South, public opinion doesn't exist, and everywhere there's a dictator who decides what uh, should happen. One can work with public opinion, and history shows, even recent history, that on some issues it was possible to make uh, progress through public opinion, civil society, pressure of peoples against governments. Uh, another question from the room, maybe? In, in, including if you have sent it by email, you can also ask it on the microphone if you're not too shy. No. <laughs> <laughs> then I think we'll go with a question from the list. Mm -hmm. um, so th this one question is, if we accept that a non-international armed conflict can take place on the territory of several high contracting parties, what are the practical consequences for a high contracting party on which territory a NIAC takes place, but to which, um, so to which conflict the high contracting party in question is not a party to? So if I can summarize, you have a non-international armed conflict and it takes place on the territory of a high contracting party to the Geneva Convention, but that specific state is not party to the, to the conflict itself, or is it? And then is the high contracting party bound by international humanitarian law? And are there any concrete obligation rights that result from the situation linked with international humanitarian law? Okay. That's for Paola. Yes. Okay. I, I feel a bit embarrassed with these questions because I feel under examination. So if like students are examining me and will give me the grade at the end. And the, so, uh, okay. I don't know, perhaps I what commentary does not answer this question, therefore the students, after having read the whole chapters, uh, has come with this question. Okay. No, I mean, that's a question that can, I mean, on the top of my head, uh, and I speak under the control of my colleagues and the colleagues in the room, certainly we have a situation whereby, in, in the Geneva Conventions in particular, you have obligations uh, that are not necessarily requesting that you are a party to the conflict, and not even that an armed conflict exists. That's generally, okay, now we have a NIAC, and the question perhaps would be only, if it's IHL in general, necessarily the party to the conflict, if we agree that uh, common article one is of customary nature and applies uh, independently from uh, any classification of the conflict, that the party will be not, will be bound by this duty to ensure the applicability of the IHL rules, if we agree that this common article one has a customary nature and applies independently of the classification of the conflict, and then necessarily all these kind of due diligence obligations that state part that a, a state has under also IHL, because I think that we always forget, in particular with the Geneva Conventions now 
Of course, the Geneva Conventions have uh, written provisions for, for, for IAC, but if we agree that most of them may have become applicable also to NIAC, well, they are always formulated in a duty to protect manner uh, sometimes, and therefore these due diligence obligations in general, including the one enshrined in Common Article 3, uh, 1, sorry, they would become applicable. Uh, that's it. That, that's about Marco for sure as a better answer. Oh, Andrew. <laughs> I don't. It's too difficult. Yes. <laughs> that's it. What's yes. your question? Are, are you sure you don't have a question that you'd like to ask yourself? No? Still not? Thank you. Um, then there's a question about internationalization of non-international armed conflict and Syria specifically. And the question reads, can we consider that there's an ongoing international armed conflict in Syria between Syria um, and a coalition of states and the Islamic State based on the fact that the Islamic State might have reached the level of government organization in certain areas of Syria as did the Taliban in 2001 in Afghanistan. You can answer both. <laughs> okay. yeah. Well, I think there's a difference, an essential difference in international law between the Islamic State and the Taliban, that Afghanistan was a recognized state. Everyone agrees Afghanistan was a state. No one considers the Islamic State a state, and the Islamic State doesn't even claim that it is the government of the Westphalian state, Syria. And therefore, that's the difference. I mean, obviously, it was an international armed conflict in 2001 between the US, by the way, even President Bush uh, accepted this, between the United States and Afghanistan because Afghanistan was a state and the de facto government of Afghanistan were the Taliban, while the Islamic State doesn't even want to be a Westphalian state, and therefore it can only be a non-international armed conflict. Um, I, I agree absolutely word for word with Marco. I've spent five years with him now um, on these topics, so he's, he's got me on the bright page. But uh, I would just add, of course, for completeness, there is an armed conflict between for example, France and uh, the Islamic State, or so-called Islamic State, that that is a non-international armed conflict uh, between a state and a non-state actor. Um, the more sort of complicated question, which we haven't answered, I suppose, is whether or not there might be an international armed conflict between France and Syria. And there I think there's probably room for um, disagreement. There are two different schools of thought, and I leave you to make up your own minds. If you want to have a position saying it is a non-international armed conflict, you, but you have to read French. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. I didn't mean that. I meant sorry. Uh, there's room for disagreement whether France is in an armed conflict with Syria or not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, on this, uh, if you want to read an argument that, uh, ah, okay, no, no, now I understand your point. You would say. Then there is no armed con either it's no armed yeah. conflict at yeah. all the exactly. relationship between yeah. France yeah. and Syria. Or there is uh, yeah. because it's okay. forming the uh, of Syria. Yeah. Okay, and <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> if you read French, um, so I, uh, um, there's a doctoral thesis by Jamila Caron, uh, the triggering act of an international armed conflict, where she makes very convincing, in my view, arguments which have changed my opinion on what I teach. Uh, that the law of international armed conflict does not apply by the mere fact that you bomb a country without the consent mm. of that country. Mm. The question is against whom the bombardment is directed and if it is clearly directed at an armed group and exclusively at an armed group, then um, it's only a non-international armed conflict then at I have to read it to this change group. My mind, then, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I have a point. yeah, yeah. No, but I was teaching two years ago. In the same way. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. I think we have a question from from the corner of the room, uh, over there, on on top. Or, okay, then speak loud, please. No, but for the micro. Ah, uh, uh, for for the people online. Sorry. But uh, so does that mean that there is no armed conflict between Syria and Russia, according to this thesis? 
No, no, no so, sorry. Uh, Putin on this issue, also he is clean in international law for once. Uh, no. <laughs> he has the agreement. He has the agreement of the, uh, of Syria. Why should there be a conflict between one state which has the agreement of the other state to intervene on the latter's territory? So Russia is clearly involved in a non-international armed conflict. While where is a controversy is whether the U.S., the United Kingdom, um, France, and from tomorrow on Germany are involved only in a non-international, but or also in an international armed conflict. And the traditional opinion is they are also involved in an international armed conflict because the local sovereign did not consent. consent. Mm -hmm. The tradition. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, we have another question from the list, which reads. Some argue that international human rights law is inappropriate for application during warfare as it stops soldiers from doing what is necessary. However, in the context of modern warfare and the prevalence of non-international armed conflicts, might we see a rise in the application of international human rights law in situations where many rules of IHL designed to protect civilians do not apply? Or do we come in full circle because non-state actors are not bound by an international human rights law either? The right person. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the premise is that most uh, armed conflicts today are non-international and therefore there may be a need to use human rights law more than in an international armed conflict. And I think that's correct in that premise in the question. Because in a non-international armed conflict, when you detain either a fighter or a civilian, you don't have the procedural protections that you find in Geneva Commentary, it's Geneva Convention, excuse me, uh, Geneva Conventions 3 and 4. Um, and so human rights, if you like, steps in to provide a modified form of habeas corpus, if you like, the right to challenge your detention and the right to have some uh, regular review of your detention. So I think uh, human rights does step in. Now the other premise in the question is that human rights would get in the way of soldiers doing what they need to do. I think the answer to that is that soldiers can detain in a non-international armed conflict. They just need to have some clear rules about what it is they're going to do. So it doesn't prevent them from what they're doing. You just need to have a legal framework. The other premise which is sort of hiding in there is that somehow human rights law would prevent soldiers from killing people on the battlefield because you have the right to life. Um, I think I'm going to sort of try and knock that on the head. The, standard um, expression in the civil and political rights covenant is that everybody has the right not to be arbitrarily deprived of their life. Now if you are standing on a battlefield, perhaps as a Taliban insurgent, and you are shooting at a peacekeeper or, or somebody who you are fighting against in a non-international armed conflict, clearly that individual is not arbitrarily taking your life when you shoot back and kill the opponent. So I don't think, I think it's a a misconception that human rights prevent soldiers from doing what they need to do. I think that, that's put around to try and exclude some of the more procedural human rights protections which are currently being fought over. Now the last part of the question says you can't, well the premise seems to be, you can't really apply human rights in a non-international armed conflict because only one side would have human rights obligations, the government side. The other side doesn't have them, is suggested in the question. I disagree. Um, I think the other side, the armed group, does have human rights obligations and therefore you do have not necessarily an equality of arms because clearly the government has many, many more human rights obligations than the armed group. The government might be party to 10, 12 human rights treaties and the group will not be, almost by definition, because they can't join a human rights treaty, but also because a lot of the provisions in the human rights treaties are not addressed to them. But the idea that there's a binary on-off answer to this, does the group have human rights obligations, is obviously wrong. If you take the protocol to the Child Rights Convention, it says armed groups should not under any circumstances recruit children or use them in hostilities. Now that's clearly addressed to the group. I know people say, oh, but the thing is addressed as should and not shall. Um, I think that's clearly absurd. <laughs> Um, if I were to say now, you should not, under any circumstances, leave this room in the next minute, 
it's clear what I am commanding you to do. It's not some option. You should not leave under any circumstances. Think about the phrase, it must be a phrase which creates an obligation. And if you want confirmation of that, the Syria Commission of Inquiry, as many of you who have had to sit through me on a Wednesday afternoon will know, um, says that the groups in Syria have violated the terms of the optional protocol to the Child Rights Convention. In other words, they have violated human rights. Thank you. Do you have a, a question from the room? <laughs> yes, Ilya. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to ask a follow-up question on, on what Professor Sassoli said actually in the, in the previous section regarding the scope of applicability of IHL in the, in the, in the NIAC between France and Syria. From what I understood you to have said, it, it, ex, it extends to the territory of the home state, in other words, France. So what practical uh, implication does this have when, let's say, uh, an example you often use of a supermarket, a terrorist uh, shopping in the supermarket. Uh, from what I understood, you, 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 you seem to imply that I, uh, human rights law would apply to his uh, incapac incapacitation. So in other words, if he is not engaged in, in some kind of a hostile act, um, human rights law framework applies. But then what is the, um, what is the consequence of us, uh, expanding the scope of uh, applicability of non-international armed conflict to the, to the home state? If, if you can't, so if, if, if we have confirmation that there's a member of ISIS who is on French territory, if he's not engaged in the hostilities, uh, the French uh, armed forces cannot target him. Yes, I agree. And what are the consequences? The same consequences as when, if there is a non-international armed conflict in Chechnya, the uh, IHL of non-international armed conflict applies also in Vladivostok. That's the traditional uh, Tadic explanation on the entire territory of the state. But in Vladivostok, it's uh, international human rights law. By the way, Vladivostok is in Europe, um, <laughs> legally. Uh, it's also in the, it's international human rights law which prevails. So, but uh, it's not totally meaningless that IHL also applies because IHL deals with some issues uh, human rights law doesn't deal with like uh, who may use the emblem, uh, who may participate in hostilities. There are rules of, uh, or perfidy. Perfidy is not, we have to make a seminar, but I would say perfidy is not prohibited in human rights law, while it is obviously prohibited uh, in both international and non-international armed conflict. So it adds something. Now, France has an official position that IHL doesn't apply in France. And I'm rather happy, despite my disagreement, because at least they do not claim that they can detain anyone in France under the laws of war. So I'm happy with that. And I would say their approach, which is the European Convention approach to which they will now derogate, uh, is the correct uh, approach also legally, conceptually, and I mean we speak about the commentary, so uh, it's about legal law and conceptions. Uh, for me, it's not possible that France is engaged in an armed conflict against ISIS in Syria, but that uh, ISIS could not uh, commit acts of, lawful acts of hostilities on French territory. It's not easy, it's quite hypothetical. Because I mean, even if they were attacking French soldiers, by definition, they would uh, commit an act of perfidy because they would disguise our civilians. But the idea that humanitarian law goes only one way is for me unacceptable. And just to add a caveat, because I suppose it's fairly obvious, but if you consider that the law of armed conflict applies in France, then in any one shootout, a war crime might be committed. Yeah. But if we have no yeah, yeah, IHL yeah. in France, no war crime. Yes. I, I think I saw another question from the, from, from the room. Yeah, yeah. 
here, a lady in the middle, and, and then the gentleman over there. Hi. Um, I just had a question about uh, equality of obligations and rights during non-international conflicts. So we mentioned human rights and whether our groups are bound by human rights, but I was thinking, what about IHL? Um, are the po both parties to non-international armed conflict necessarily bound by the same rights and obligations? Can we have armed groups that are bound by more obligations than others in view of the territory they control, the capacity to fulfill them? Or do states, can states have more rights and obligations compared to armed groups? If I may compliment the question, um, do <laughs> a non-state armed group have different human rights obligations depending on whether they control territory or not? Take the last question first. Um, I don't think that the territorial um, trigger is helpful. I think there may be armed groups that don't control territory that do have human rights obligations. So I prefer personally not to see this as related. I think it relates more to what you're suggesting. It's their capacity to respect the rights and to fulfill them. Um, I'll answer your question and then I'll pass the microphone to the colleagues. I, can some armed groups have more obligations than the state was inherent in the question? I think they can, and as many of you in the room know, that if Geneva Call goes to an armed group and asks them to enter into a deed of commitment, for example, not to use anti-personnel landmines, that often happens in a situation when the state itself has not ratified the Ottawa Treaty. So in that situation, the armed group does have greater obligations, and it may even be an incentive for the armed group to get into such a dialogue because they want to be able to say, look, we are respecting more humanitarian norms than the state that we're fighting against. So we could have an argument as to whether or not that's a real obligation with a capital O or some moral obligation, but I think for practical purposes, they have more obligations than the government they're fighting against. So I think it is quite possible that um, in some circumstances, an armed group might have more obligations. I don't think the equality of arms norm is a use Coggins norm? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I fully agree. Just on IHL, under the existing treaties, not under uh, unila uh, additional unilateral commitments, the traditional answer is equality of arms. And like in our commentary, let us distinguish Lex Lata and Lex Ferenda. I have written Lex Ferenda that perhaps we should abandon it because it's unrealistic and unrealistic rules don't protect anyone and so on. But the existing law is equality of arms. The law, however, is flexible in the sense that most of IHL, you know, customary rules cannot be formulated, and even if the ICSE study formulated them, you don't have to take the wording, but it's the idea behind it. And so I would say most rules are flexible so that they can be adapted to the possibility of the armed groups. And so, for instance, you have to take feasible precautions. A state has more possibility to take uh, more precautions than an armed group. But this doesn't mean that they have different obligations. They have the same obligation, but the obligation or uh, imperative security reason or even the treatment of detainees in Protocol Additional 2 in Article 5, there is a second paragraph which says, if possible. Uh, and then if an armed group has no territorial control, for instance, it may not be possible to do X, Y, but it is possible to do another thing. So I think most of the rules, and someone should make an analysis going through all of them, are already are such flexible that they do not, if you look only, sorry that I'm a civil law person, uh, if you look just as the text of the rule, while when it comes interpretation in view of human rights law and so on, then indeed, in my view, uh, the, the obligations of an armed group, for instance, procedural guarantees, the basic idea that you cannot detain a person without the person being able to appeal to someone else to say, I'm a taxi driver, not a fighter, this is applicable to both sides. But the exact guarantees must be different concerning uh, someone in turn by an armed group and by a state. 
I think we had a, a question here. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, for three professors for, the, for their presentation and for the work in this, in this book. Uh, I have a question related to what was mentioned before on state responsibility and the Geneva Conventions also, particularly on the issue of aid or assistance or, or complicity and how uh, complicity and uh, violations of IHL could be complementary and what are the challenges to uh, enforce respect for IHL through making responsible also third states that provide financial assistance or transfer arms to these uh, uh, other states that are violating IHL or even uh, thinking, uh, uh, building on what you've said, that non-state actors have IHL obligations, also states providing arms or uh, financial assistance to uh, non-state actors. Thank you. The question, of course, is big. Sometimes I've also had an opportunity to discuss with some colleagues, and Professor Agemager in particular, he gave me uh, an idea about that, uh, that sometimes I suspect <laughs> that the great development of international criminal law in the 90s was seen as a way to complement the killing of uh, international crimes in the law of state responsibility. I don't know if it was done on purpose uh, or it was done by accident, but certainly the idea that we insist on international criminal law is in a one way to try to get rid of the burning issue, which kind of responsibility for states uh, who participate in serious violations of humanitarian law and human rights either as direct responsible or accomplices. Now, certainly, I mean, your question has already an answer. We will apply the rules on state responsibility, and if the parameters of uh, state's complicity would be applicable, then you might have a state responsible as an accomplice to the violation of IHL, of serious violation of IHL committed by the main party to the conflict in such a case, also in terms of uh, uh, giving weapons, uh, allowing the transfer of weapons that are used to, for committing serious violation of IHL, which may amount to war crimes, but from the point of view of state responsibility must be seen as serious violations of IHL. Uh, and therefore, both the states uh, would be responsible. And I think here we lack a mechanism uh, to induce compliance. And I see with much regret the national case law from certain countries uh, which, uh, of course, I speak of Germany, but also of Italy, whenever they have been asked to provide reparation to victims, they said, oh, it's an act of state, it's not justiciable, there is no right to compensation or whatever. That, I think, is the issue for tomorrow, uh -huh. the burning issue. Um, another thing that I didn't have the opportunity to say, and I take the opportunity to do so, although I've written in the chapter, I think it's also important. Uh, IHL is made not only by rules, uh, which in case of violation are potentially criminalizable uh, violations. Of course, uh, those, the gist of humanitarian law is made of rules that if not respected, uh, may be subject to criminal punishment. But there are many others who are, uh, which are nonetheless central in the working and functioning of IHL, which are not of a criminal nature, let's say, even the, the obligation to enact legislation to criminalize grave breaches. If the parliament does not pass such a legislation, can you make them accountable for war crimes? No. But nonetheless, this should be a violation, a serious one, let's say, of IHL, which should have some consequences on the plane of state responsibility. And therefore, uh, and I know that Professor Sassoli agrees with me because I've heavily cited his work, on the matter, uh, we shall not think that those rules uh, are important only if they amount to a crime, because otherwise we forget that there is a whole part of IHL which is made of not criminalizable rules, but are crucial. I'll take the question on whether a state supplying arms to a non-state actor is violating international law. Um, Short answer is I think it is uh, because of the Nicaragua United States judgment of the International Court of Justice. So I'm in good company, um, which seems to suggest that uh, the supplying and training of uh, guerrillas, if you like, in an, somebody else's country who are engaged in an internal armed conflict in that country is a violation of the sovereignty of the country where the armed conflict is going on. 
So they don't call it um, a violation of 2.4 of the Charter, so they don't uh, make it equivalent to the use of force, but they say it's a violation of the sovereignty of the state where the armed conflict is going on. Of course, they're not, in that case, deciding under the UN Charter, but under customary international law, but um, the point is, I think most states agree that it's illegal. Now, the fact that it's going on and that states from time to time will deny that it's going on maybe reinforces the fact that it's illegal. Even when you listen to the speeches by uh, the British Prime Minister or the French President about arming people in Syria, I noticed the other day they're quite careful to say our supply of non-lethal equipment. So if they obviously thought it was legal to send actual arms, I don't think they would bother prefacing it like that. So the, the idea is that uh, the current uh, flow of arms from the West to the groups there is not supposed to be um, weapons that can be used in the armed conflict. I mean, we're all aware that something else is going on, but the international law, I don't think, has changed. Although, and Professor Clapp and I, we disagree in the interpretation of the paragraph of the ICJ in Nicaragua, because I do think that it is a violation of 2-4, but, but it's, we'll leave it aside for another book. Do we have another question from, from the room? Yeah? Over here in, in the middle, in the suit. Thank you uh, for the event. I have um, a question regarding um, the issue which uh, has already been uh, touched upon. It's uh, the relationship be uh, between uh, Lex Lata and Lex Verenda. Uh, so the question is, uh, to which extent uh, are uh, IHL norms uh, comprehensive? Uh, and uh, to which extent uh, can they be uh, stretched uh, to address some issues uh, uh, which uh, were not uh, envisaged uh, by the drafters of the, of the Geneva Conventions and uh, of the Hague Regulations. Because uh, in the 90s we saw an uh, appraise of uh, judicial activism to uh, address some gaps in IHL. And uh, uh, to, uh, in, in your opinion, uh, uh, will we uh, be facing um, uh, the same situation in the future. Uh, so, uh, view of the future courts or the future uh, uh, academics uh, uh, will uh, publish on this issue and uh, will, will address it because. So, the question is essentially uh, I'm sorry, uh, how many gaps are there in IHL and uh, what are uh, the uh, ways to address them? Uh, and to which extent is this uh, judicial activism is a key to this question and how, uh, can there be any others, other ways to address it? Thank you. May I give the very traditional answer? International law has no gaps. No, no, the, uh, no, international humanitarian law has some gaps, but uh, it's part of international law, and then there's an answer somewhere else. Uh, it is only if you are convinced that certain things are right and other things are wrong that you see gaps. Like, uh, if you ask me, is there a rule of international law which prohibits the Graduate Institute to paint the whole building in pink? My answer is not there is a gap, but simply, yes, this is lawful under international law. There's no rule of international law prohibiting this. And uh, therefore, while obviously this is a very traditional answer, I think in the Geneva Conventions, it depends also how you approach them. Uh, if it is more in a civil law uh, way of seeing it like a court civil, uh, which has some general rules, and when there are new phenomena, you apply the existing rule to the new phenomena. And this is not only code civil, it's also the US Constitution. They don't revise the Constitution each time new technology comes up. They didn't even revise the Constitution when railways came up. So they can deal with railways which didn't exist when the Constitution was made, and the same uh, today, uh, 
And the same thing is true largely for IHL, but as we tried to, to the authors tried to explain on some issues, indeed, there's no answer by IHL, but that doesn't mean, mean that other branches of international law do not provide an answer. And I'm clearly against the idea that uh, there is a qualified silence in IHL. Every time IHL, for instance, there's nothing about freedom of opinion in IHL, to the best of my knowledge. And some people would then argue this means there is no freedom of opinion in armed conflict, which seems to me nonsense. Um, I think I'd just like to address the, something you hinted at in your question, which was the idea of judicial activism. And I think that that phrase has come more in terms of constitutional law and human rights law. That judges, I would say, traditionally, when faced with the Geneva Conventions or IHL, tend to lose their sort of activist streak. So your sort of uh, concern, if I can put it like that in the question, that the judges were going to develop IHL to stretch it beyond its limits or to fill gaps, I didn't see any empirical evidence of that as we were going along. I found the judges uh, a little overawed by uh, IHL. On the other hand, when a judge confronts a human right, the judge sort of thinks they know what to do with it and where to take it. So there's a huge contrast there, and I think that is partly uh, why now some states are interested in playing a bit of catch-up, if I can put it like that, in the realm of the Geneva Conventions, to have regular meetings and to have a forum and to have a place where interpretative uh, ideas about IHL maybe are generated as they are for the last 60 years in human rights. Of course, because you think of the European Court of Human Rights, but if the judicial activism is referred to ICTY mm -hmm. and the toute la bande, <laughs> starting with Professor Cassese and that, okay, with that, it's of course this has been something that uh, has been a matter of concern. Um, and of course, from the criminal law point of view, the question there of the judicial activism, I think you were thinking of, it is also for the protection of the principle of legality from the point of view of the accused. Um, but I tend to, now I know that it's totally perhaps unrelated, but since the relationship between IHL and human rights law in non international conflict has been a matter of discussion, I'm now in a way um, thinking of the mistakes I was hinting uh, uh, this uh, to Professor Sartoli before, of Tadit, of the consequences which were not expected, that I don't think Professor Cassese in participating in the Tadic decision had taken into account. We have not to forget that when Tadic came out in 1995, uh, the European Court of Human Rights was not yet uh, active in applying I, human rights law to in armed conflict. Um, Professor Cassese came from uh, an, an, an era where human rights uh, for him were just under the way of being developed, but for him uh, the idea was international law was not dealing with civil conflicts and this was a bad thing. And therefore he wanted to assure a better protection uh, to people and the Tadic case was concerning about people in a detention camp. Okay, so it was not conduct of hostilities case, although there are some passages in the Tadic relating to the use of chemical weapons and conduct of hostilities, but he was saying that additional protocol two had become customary for that kind of conflict, not for all conflicts, but additional protocol two, most rules of that kind of conflict had become customary. And then he would say, a rape is a rape, and the torture is torture. Why we have to make it criminal in that context and not in another one? Now, of course, the analogy, the customer assimilation, it is perhaps not problematical when it comes to the protection of victims of warfare, when the person in one way or another is harmless, so why you shall not call it a war crime. But then the analogy has been expanded to cover non-international conflict and conduct of hostilities. And there, the expansion in the judicial activism perhaps has caused more problems that we wanted to solve, I think. Thank you. Is there another question from the room? If not, I think we'll go back to the, to the list. And we have one question about private military and security companies, which reads, 
As the phenomenon of private military companies is, increasing, is increasingly sorry, present in the scenarios of armed conflicts, either international or non-international, how does international humanitarian law apply to PMSCs? Um, thank you. Well, there is a bit of a myth that somehow PMCs are not covered by international law and that there is, again, a gap. Um, but I think on a moment's reflection, it's clearly not the case. An individual working for a private military company who gets involved in torture in a detention camp um, in any kind of armed conflict is going to have committed a war crime and they can be prosecuted. Um, whether they're working for Blackwater or whether they're working for another company or whether they're working for a government or for an armed group. You, you have committed the war crime and you could be prosecuted if there's an international court with jurisdiction there or elsewhere. Um, then you turn to the question as whether the company as such is bound under the laws of international humanitarian law. That gets a little more complicated. Um, I think the ICRC have put out a document suggesting that companies do have responsibilities under international humanitarian law. The issue for me is uh, where would you actually then hold them accountable? Because as we know, you can hold a state accountable in the International Court of Justice or, or through its national courts. Those companies themselves, they may have violated the law in the state where they're operating. So Blackwater in Iraq violated the law of Iraq. They also violated, I think, international law, but we could leave that aside for the moment. The problem that happened in Iraq with Blackwater, for example, and some of the other companies, is that Iraq, or rather the occupying forces, the CPA at the time, passed a law which said you could not sue a private military company in the Iraqi jurisdiction. So that gave rise to the idea that somehow companies are above the law. Now that ordinance no longer applies. So you can sue a company for violating the national law or indeed for violating the Geneva Conventions. There are some cases, but um, Marco Sassoli is more expert than me. I think they may even be in his casebook where companies have been accused of violating the Geneva Conventions as such in national courts. It's a, I'm thinking of a Canadian jurisdiction, where in the end they held there was, it was an inappropriate forum. But the co concept is clearly there, that the Geneva Conventions can create obligations within national law and can then be used against a corporation. Lastly, there is a third possibility, which is that the corporation itself could be prosecuted for an international crime, a war crime. And that prospect um, has always remained until now, I think, rather abstract and theoretical. But again, um, with apologies to my own students, uh, it, for the rest of you, there is now a protocol to the African Court of Human and People's Rights, which, should it come into force, will allow for a criminal chamber where individuals and companies can be prosecuted. And amongst the list of crimes which can be used to prosecute a company are, of course, war crimes, genocide, and so on, but also the crime of mercenarism. So without a long lecture on mercenarism, the crime of being a mercenary company is actually covered by international criminal law, at least in the African Union system in the future. So these are things which are coming around the corner for the moment the best chance of bringing your claim against a private security company is still the alien tort statute in the United States. And so that is where the interesting litigation took place against Blackwater for the events in Baghdad in Nissa Square. And that case was settled um, in the end for several million dollars. So we don't have a judgment that I can read out to you as to what the answer is. But the point was that the Blackwater private military company was being held accountable under the law of the Geneva Conventions for war crimes, which in alien tort statute terms is the law of nations, which is another great topic, but not today. Thank you. Uh, a question from the room, maybe? Still none? <laughs> then, um, we have a question on the um, obscure International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission. And the question reads, before the events in Kunduz, has the commission ever been used? 
For example, in Syria, with regards to chemical weapons, they referred to UN special procedures. If nobody ever considered the commission, why is this the case? Do you believe that the US would consent on the establishment of a fact-finding mission with regards to Kunduz? The commission is established by Article 90 of Additional Protocol 1. Could we have something similar for non-international armed conflicts? The International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission has never been used. Uh, also, how many states? 70. She's an expert. 76? <laughs> 72 states have accepted its jurisdiction, which means that the Commission has jurisdiction between two states which have accepted uh, the jurisdiction. It's like the optional clause uh, in the ICJ statute, Article 36, Paragraph 2. And um, the first armed the first alleged armed conflicts between two states having made the declaration is the possible armed conflict between Ukraine and Russia, because both Ukraine and Russia have accepted. But even Ukraine, which obviously claims that Russia is involved in the conflict by having control over the armed group in eastern Ukraine, even Ukraine has not asked the Commission to uh, to start an inquiry, which it could legally, uh, unilaterally. And the reason is that obviously the Commission, once it would start to inquire, it doesn't inquire uh, against one party, but both parties. And as the Ukrainians also commit violations, they don't want to have uh, um, an inquiry into these violations. Now, for non-international armed conflict, the Commission has declared that it is ready to work also in non-international armed conflict, but based on the principle of consent of both sides. And so, in a non-international armed conflict like Kunduz, Afghanistan, there should be consent by the US and Afghanistan on the one hand, and the Taliban on the other hand. And this is realistic, except if you have troops, you can make an inquiry only with people who consent to your inquiry. Sorry, this is the reality. And uh, why isn't it used? Um, I think the first point is that uh, you need not only consent, but really triggering by states. And states are like inhabitants of a Sicilian village Uh, 50 years ago, there is omerta. I don't, I mean, legally, Switzerland could ask the Commission, it has accepted, against Russia. But Switzerland will never, 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 never do it. Um, and Ukraine doesn't even do it because this would be probably more than uh, being involved in an armed conflict to ask the Commission to inquire. The second reason is, so we need a mechanism which can work ex officio and not be asked by states, because that doesn't work. Second, the commission is too independent. Sorry. From two points of view. The first point of view, it has no institutional embedding. You know, all these UN commissions, they belong to the UN. And they make a report, and the report goes to the Secretary General or the Human Rights Council or the Security Council, and there's a follow-up. And there's also a secretariat, which, you know, when Desmond Tutu and uh, Judge Goldstone, they cannot really make an inquiry. They need young people like you. But the Commission doesn't have young people like you. <laughs> While the UN, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has people. And therefore, when they decide Uh, to make a commission of inquiry, there are people actually working uh, on the ground. And finally, the report of the commission is confidential, and therefore, uh, today, this is unrealistic. I mean, on Kunduz, even MSF, in my view, I don't know why my friend uh, Francois Saunier, uh, she must have slept while MSF said the commission. Because the result of this would be MSF would never learn what happened. Because the report of the commission, except if all parties agree, is confidential. So 
this, in my view, are the reasons why the Commission cannot work. Also, it would be very important that facts are established. And the chapter by Theo Boutruch explains this. Obviously not Article 90, because it's a com commentary of the Geneva Convention. Uh, because most of the time, what is controversial are the facts, not the law. The Syrian government does not claim that it is lawful to use chemical weapons. It simply says, we don't use. It's our enemies who use. And so, also, obviously, we lawyers, we are fascinated by the legal controversies. The real controversies in the world are about facts. And uh, does state X torture or doesn't it torture? Once we know it tortures, there's no controversy anymore. So, um, it would be so important also, and this is a point which is very dear to me, to prove that certain facts are not true. States are often accused of violations which are not, did not happen. And in the public opinion, and including many of my students, they imply that anyway, the US, Israel, Russia, do not care about IHL, which is very deadly for IHL. And I have to tell you that the young people in the Middle East, they are convinced that the US doesn't care about IHL. While I know that the US armed forces have very sophisticated systems, on interpretations I do not always uh, agree with, to enforce IHL. And therefore, it would be in the interest uh, to have an inquiry to show that in some cases there was no violation. But unfortunately, states are obsessed and military are obsessed by secret. And therefore, they do not want to have such inquiries, which is a pity. A question from the room? <laughs> Still not. <laughs> um, then we have um, another question from the list, and it's about missing persons and enforced disappearances. It's written in French, but I'll try and translate it. Um, so there seems to be a difference between missing persons in times of armed conflict and enforced disappearances in times of peace. Regarding the situation in Syria and the allegation of enforced disappearances, as it is an armed conflict, um, but the, the disappearances seem to be enforced disappearances and not necessarily disappearances linked to the armed conflict, the concept of missing persons, I was wondering what would be the answer of IHL regarding the situation. So the, the question is, in Syria, since you have an armed conflict, the author of the contribution on, on the topic suggests that you would have to use the concept of missing person and not the notion of enforced disappearances, because it doesn't apply in times of armed conflict. And, and because she makes the difference between time of peace and war time. Oh yeah, but does she right. really suggest that... Um, there cannot be... Not our chapter, no. no, no. I reread it. I reread it. In the, on the basis of this question, I reread quickly the chapter by Anna Petrig to see if it was in one way misleading, because to my understanding, the law does not say that enforced disappearances are only applicable if there is no armed conflict, namely in time of peace. Uh, certainly, the laws on enforced disappearances, uh, both over the UN Convention and the human rights interpretation of enforced disappearances, would be applicable also in terms of armed conflict. Simply, the notion of missing persons, so to my understanding, is larger than enforced disappearances. Uh, and the Geneva Conventions and additional protocols, they do deal with the notion of missing persons. Uh, uh, now, therefore, if I reformulate the question, certainly in the situation of Syria, where you might have some persons who have gone missing because they are subject and victims of enforced disappearances, all the relevant provisions will become applicable. And uh, I wouldn't see any conflict here uh, between the missing persons provisions in IHL and the enforced disappearances provisions under human rights law or the UN Convention. And this will be certainly complementary in the sense of reinforcing each other rather than having conflicting obligations. Uh, now, um, of course, the missing provisions, missing persons provisions will be, uh, become not applicable anymore once there is a certificate of death, an official certificate of death, because the person would have been not missing anymore, but we know about that. But does not mean that the enforced disappearances will not continue 
uh, provisions, uh, even after a declaration of death. That's, um, but <coughs> I speak under your control. No, no. <laughs> um, just for absolute completeness, because it's a very sophisticated audience, um, in the American Convention on Enforced Disappearances, there is a clause which says this treaty will not apply to situations of armed conflict to which the Geneva Conventions and its protocol applies. And I've explained that. And just I wanted to warn you that if you are careless when you look up that treaty on the internet, there's a misprint because it says, and the Geneva Convention and its protocols apply. Yeah. But the original says, and its protocol, and it applies to additional protocol one. So it would only apply mm. to an international armed conflict. Yeah. And so to answer, the, if Syria were in the Latin American region, and you were applying the Latin American con Convention or the American Convention to give it the proper name, then you would um, not be able. You would be able to apply the Enforced Disappearances Convention under human rights law to the conflict in Syria. You just can't use it in an international armed conflict. And we have another question regarding uh, international and non-international armed conflicts, and it goes: If the responsiveness of international humanitarian law to new realities is precisely what has kept this body of law current and relevant, is this standoff between law and practice quite at risk? As with that non-international armed conflict rules applying, supposedly human rights law should be the only legal body applicable, but this is rejected by states where extraterritorial operations are concerned, so we're left with the legal lacuna. I guess it's more of a statement uh, than a question, but it calls for comments. Um. Just very briefly on extraterritoriality, um, I'm beginning to feel that there's a confusion here because the states that insist that they have no human rights obligations when their troops are abroad always refer to language in particular human rights treaties such as the Civil and Political Rights Covenant which talks about things happening within your territory and jurisdiction. But in fact, um, we forget when we teach that human rights law also includes customary human rights law. And there is nothing in customary human rights law to suggest that you do not have a human rights obligation when your troops travel abroad. So the American objection, which everybody recants and reminds us of all the time, is when they physically come here to Geneva to defend themselves before the Human Rights Committee. But you can read American military manuals which talk about their obligation to respect customary human rights law when their soldiers are abroad. So the extraterritorial thing I would rather suggest to you is a jurisdictional question. Which international bodies can oversee human rights violations when they're carried out abroad? It doesn't affect the state's obligation under human rights. If a state sends its soldiers abroad, in, whether it's an armed conflict or not, and it starts torturing and killing people, Human rights law applies. The fact that you might not be able to raise a case in a particular international instance is a separate jurisdictional question. I would like to believe that here we disagree for the first time. Uh, I would like to believe that it works as Andrew uh, suggests, and I didn't make the analysis. It is well possible that if you look into state practice and opinion juris, states indeed consider that they have human rights obligations abroad. But simply, it's not because it's customary law that it is applicable to everyone. And everywhere in the world, eh, I mean, the Geneva Conventions, not only as treaties do not apply today in this room, but also the parallel customary rules, because the Geneva Conventions only apply in armed conflicts. And so, unfortunately, the regrettable position of some states is perhaps also state practice. The treaty practice is also state practice for custom law. But obviously, if the US, and there are some indications, uh, if the US shows that what Andrew says, that it is only uh, the jurisdiction of the implementing body which it doesn't want, then obviously, and it agrees that the substantive obligations exist, which is, for instance, clearly not the position of Israel, but perhaps of the US, then uh, we have, as always, to make this strange process. We go into the black tunnel of customary law, and something comes out of it, and we will see whether 
this is or is not. But simply, I would say, it's not because it's customary law that there are no limitations. Customary rules also have territorial, personal, scope of application, material scope of application, customary, IHL also needs a nexus with the conflict and so on. Um, we have one last question, and as, as this has been a very interesting, deep, uh, detailed and substantive discussion, I think I'd like to end with a more general question about the commentary. Um, and do the co-editors view the commentary as a response to those criticizing the Geneva Conventions as obsolete, either because they, they are sorry, either because they are now less protective than human rights in some respects, or because their applicability rests on categories of conflict that do not correspond to the time of conflicts or actors? And do the co-editors see interpretative efforts to clarify and develop the law as displacing the need to agree on new rules? But um, I will answer first, but I'm sure that my colleagues would like to intervene. And I must also take the opportunity to, to say how much I've enjoyed the discussion of the editorial board uh, and, uh, and to have the pleasure to listen to often Marco and Andrew um, not agreeing sometimes, but then to find common points of view. Uh, thank you for those fruitful discussion and also to have still be friends, as Andrew once told me, and after those long process, we're still friends. Um, uh, the, the answer to that, I, didn't, I mean, personally, I don't think that the Geneva Conventions are obsolete at all. On the contrary, I think they are perhaps uh, uh, certainly still very much alive, and not only because they may continue to apply to, unfortunately, international conflict that uh, they may still an issue of today, but also because they they have been uh, the occasion to the development of customer international law rules applicable to NIAC, uh, in, because they are protective in scope. And in particular, I insist on the fact that the most of those provisions they establish and they are precursor, let's say, of the human rights obligation of duty to protect, we forget that the Geneva Conventions, as I was mentioning this morning, are mostly formulated in duty uh, to, to ensure a certain behavior or a certain form of protection. And therefore, there is not only a question of direct responsibilities for the states, but also due diligence of obligations. So for instance, the protection from rape is not only a prohibition from states, uh, parties to the conflict, to commit rape. Uh, the provision is not formulated in this way. It's formulated in terms of uh, the party shall ensure protection from rape, which is something more. And therefore, this is, I think, is very alive uh, in terms of due diligence of obligation. And therefore, I don't think that we have considered uh, this not really at all as a response, on the contrary, on the fact that for us it's for granted that they are still uh, very well alive. Not obsolete. I'm sure that you want to add something. No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then uh, thank you very much to the three co-editors of the commentary and for everyone um, for coming and for contributing to the discussion. Thank you.